Jack Barnett, age 26, is charged with murder and found guilty. He is issued a life sentence at an asylum. The court trials took place on the 14th of February, 1993. The incident took place on the 24th of December in 1992. District of Columbia, Washington. Jack Barnett drove his pickup truck to a small ranch just outside the city. This farmhouse stood on a plain, surrounded by towering trees. Its proprietor, David Shank, has hired Jack to find and kill what he thinks is attacking his livestock, a wolf. Being a professional hunter, Jack sees this as a quick and simple task. David Shank offers all of the information he has on the attacks. Shank noticed that he would find one of his goats missing and would spot a cow corpse. These were no ordinary corpses though. The carcasses seemed to be riddled with holes, about ten of them. These were deep, gaping holes, unlike any that would have been left by a wolf's teeth. The only evidence of non-human entry or exit onto Mr. Shank's property were some deer tracks. They walked into the house, which was fairly ordinary as Jack was concerned. They sat at the table where they had coffee and discussed the terms of their agreement. Jack would be paid only upon completion of the task. It was around 5 o'clock when Jack began investigating. He first went to see the barn. Nothing strange aside from a whole ridden cow corpse and deer tracks. Barnett went around the whole area. Nothing of interest. It was too late to investigate further. Night was falling quickly. Jack and David prepared. Two hunting shotguns, each utilizing 12 gauge rounds, strong enough to pierce through two inches of steel. Their secondary arms were standard 9mm pistols, both of which were semi-automatic. And so they waited near the barnyard. It was 10 o'clock in the evening, or at night. David and Jack waited for a good two hours. Shank, who fell asleep on the cold, moist ground. A rustling sound came from the woods nearby. Jack's hands were shaking. He trembled. He was sweating like a pig. His forefinger inched only toward the trigger of his shotgun. And as a figure appeared out of the forest, a loud bang echoed across the wilderness. A ringing sound in Jack's ears prevented him from concentrating. His head spun and his eyes wandered, searching for something to make him relax. But what he found was far from relaxing. A half-dead, bloody deer with a red, gut-strewn paste hanging out of its place fell to the ground. As this creature twisted and jerked, Barnett passed out beside David, who surprisingly remained asleep even after the gunshot. Still dizzy from whatever happened, Jack rose from his slumber. The deer had now been dead for three hours. It was around three in the morning, and this living nightmare had just begun. Jack managed to prop himself up with the help of his gun, of course. He placed his hand on Shank's shoulder, shaking him lightly. The pair went over to the cornfield, where Jack had investigated earlier. And much to their surprise, they spotted two humongous antlers protruding out of the stalks. They entered the small forest of crops as they loaded up their weapons. Five feet away, the sound of breathing and footsteps plodding through the damp soil filled their ears. Four feet away. The two men took a few steps. Three feet away. Their breath condensed in the chilly morning air. Two feet away. Jack was hyperventilating ever so quietly. His heart raced, 
His spine tingled. Then he put his finger on the trigger. Trigger. Click. Bang. Echo. Deep breath. Plop. Better him than us, said Shank, who managed to smile at the dead moose's carcass. The two were breathing heavily as if they had just ran a marathon. The pair headed back to the farmhouse. Door. Knob. Twist. Open. Enter. Close. Chain lock. Slide. Walk away. And for a moment, they felt safe. Everything was perfect in the little ranch house. Shank told Barnett to get some rest. Jack went to the guest bathroom and washed up. The freezing water hitting his face, causing him to briefly shout. The sound of that shout never reached Shank's ears, though. The noise of heavy rain filled the corridors and rooms of the house. Jack jumped due to the brief flash of light, followed by a heavy cracking sound. Jack tilted his head towards the small window in the wall. What he saw next was indescribable. A pair of antlers entered Jack's peripheral vision. Then it disappeared due to the absence of light. Another strike of lightning but what Jack discovered was that this was not a creature he had ever seen before. The antlers were now resting upon what seemed to be a human head. He scanned the figure closely, which had its back turned on Jack. The porch lights were then triggered due to movement. Now Jack could see. A head with antlers. A human head with antlers. Then Jack saw its body. The figure harbored human-like features, yet at the same time it looked intriguing. Long, spider-like arms, like arms that a man shouldn't ever have. Its skin was as pale, as pale as gray could get. Its figure was unnerving. The thing's bones were all too evident as if they were going to be ripped out of the figure's skin. The legs. Jack had seen legs like these before, except that they were attached to the body of a deer. These legs were very long and slender. Its feet were hidden in the ground, if it had feet at all. Then, the lights went out. Lightning. The figure was now closer to the window, still having its back turned. Darkness. Then, light again. Jack froze. The thing was now looking into Jack. It was not just staring. No, it looked into him. Jack was frozen. He didn't stop staring back. Whether it was out of fear or awe, he stared. The eyes of that creature were dazzling in a horrifying sense. They were white as mist. This whiteness filled its eyes, nothing but white. Its smile was most unnerving. It smiled in a way that looked wrong, as if its jaws were too small to hold this terrifying grin. Darkness. Light. The thing was gone. Jack fell to the floor and started breathing heavily, He closed his eyes and hummed himself a lullaby. For some reason, Jack did not ask himself what he had just seen. A sense of familiarity struck him. Jack put on a coat and went outside. He was now looking at the deer tracks, and he followed them into the forest. What he found was shocking. The deer tracks morphed track by track. The hooves became hands, human hands, imprinted into the soil. The hairs on his body stood. Goosebumps were now all over his skin. Then he goes into the barn where another horror awaited him. A fresh corpse of a cow. Same as the others, it was ridden with holes. Jack nearly vomited. He leans in closer, touches the carcass, and it turns out to be hollow, 
as if the cow had just been professionally gutted from head to toe. His skin was crawling. He shuddered. It was four in the morning. Then Jack hears a loud sound from the house. The sound of a door breaking. He runs. Arriving at the door, he stops. The door was still there, though, intact. But then he turned around, and the figure towered over Jack in all of its nine-foot terror. In its hand was a familiar object. The object's name was David Shank. The figure walks closer. It contorted its back and hunched. It bent its arms in strange ways, causing Shank to be flung around freely. And now it was standing over Jack. It smiled, the smile that only it could make. Jack closed his eyes as the figure stood over him, unblinking, unmoving. DC police find Shank's body impaled on a tree, full of holes. A shotgun was placed near this tree. Sound evidence of a murder. The boy is ridden with holes, but it did not turn out to be a body. It was a piece of skin wrapped in clothing. The police find James's fingerprints on the gun. In court, Jack claimed that it was not him. The only thing he said throughout the duration of the trials. He's going to come for you, all of you, one by one, then he'll take me. When they asked him what was it, he simply titled it The Elk Man. Little is known about the Elk Man today. It has only been seen once, and the sighting has been dismissed as a criminal delusion. Based on Barnett's description, the Elk Man had eyes that would shift from normal black pupil eyes into completely white or pitch black. This suggests that this creature has an extremely high level of perception in terms of sight, considering it can even see. The limbs of the creature were described as bony and deer-like. This would suggest some biological similarities between the creature and some of today's quadrupedal mammals. I'd like to start off by saying that I don't even have a clue why I'm posting this, or really at all. Maybe I'm afraid of dying or something. The events described in this story happened a month, a month and a half ago, in Shannondale, West Virginia, although I typed this up about two weeks ago. I just haven't really had the guts to post this until what happened yesterday. The story goes that in late September, when my family went to go visit our relatives, who invited us up to celebrate one of them getting like $2,000 in some scratch-off lottery thingy. They live in this really shitty part of Shannondale that people from Charlestown, Shepherdstown, and Ranson like to call the Squalor Holler. It's way up on the mountains, and exactly like how everyone pictures it when they hear about it. Nothing but ramshackle shacks, rusty, rebuilt trailers, and everything covered in decade-old Christmas decorations because they're all too busy being smelly rednecks to ever clean up. Real deliverance-like shit here. Just no rivers or canoes. The relatives we were visiting are absolutely confirmed inbreeders. All cousins having sex with each other. We don't refer to them as aunt, uncle, whatever. Just relatives. Not terrible people or anything, just absolutely cartoonish, depressing hillbilly stereotypes. So anyway, we're up here in this godforsaken trailer. It sucks. There's like eight of them, plus me, my dad, my mom, and my sister. About two hours in, my mom takes my cell phone so that I can focus on family time together, which is bull because all we did the whole time was eat TV dinners and be forced to watch NASCAR and other stupid stuff. After like six hours of this, about ten minutes before we're supposed to leave, it starts raining. We know how treacherous the roads can get up on the mountain, 
so we decide to wait for the rain to die down. Flash forward two hours later. It's dark as hell, 10 o'clock, and there's a flood warning for the area. I have my phone back this time. No reception though, of course, because we're in the mountains. I'm playing Tetris and Texas Hold'em and stuff, when suddenly I hear my dad start losing it in the next room. I walk over, and it turns out that they let slip that they'd buried their kid, Thomas, outside, and apparently were afraid the rain would wash up his body or some other crap. The kid was like six. He was attacked by a dog and they never told the cops. Just buried him like he was a family pet. My dad's flipping his shit, and rightfully so because, you know, we live in the 21st century and all. So our relatives say that they'll sort it all out in the morning. My parents tell me and my sister to stay in the same room as them during the night, and we do. None of us really suspected that they'd killed Thomas or anything, since they're really peaceful people. They didn't even own any guns aside from this one old-timey double-barrel shotgun they had on a mantle. Nevertheless, we were creeped out. Creeped the hell out, I should say. And intended to tell the police in the morning once we got to town. So, it was like three in the morning. I couldn't sleep. Power had gone out for the fifth time or so and I'm not able to charge my dead phone. The worst part is, I could see Thomas's little grave right outside my window, a little cross on it and everything, and I assumed the kid couldn't have been buried deep at all since they were so worried about him just washing up out of the grave. So I was just so fixated on that, kept being drawn to looking out the window. And then I saw the worst thing in my life, Something was creeping through the trees toward the house. I stared at it for a while but couldn't get a good look at it since it was raining and the brush was so thick. For a few minutes I assumed it was two really pale horses, kind of just ambling through the woods side by side, but then it walked into the moonlight and I saw that it was all one thing, like a kind of human torso but wider it finally stepped into full view, and I saw it had something like six legs, kind of somewhere between a beetle's legs and a horse's legs. Two arms, right where someone would normally have had them, but they were about half a foot longer than any normal man's arms. It had a bald head, but the face looked like some sort of bizarre masquerade ball kind of mask. This thing clenched up furrowed forehead and a nose that looked like some sort of crow's or raven's beak. It didn't have eyes either, just the depressions where the eye should go. It looked like it had a human mouth underneath its proboscis. What still strikes me to this day is that it seemed to have a penis too, like right on the abdomen where a normal person's penis would be. The thing moved gracefully and made these soft thump thumping noises when it moved. It must have been like seven, eight feet tall, but sounded like it weighed maybe only 150 pounds at most. It starts walking towards Thomas's grave, and then I finally snap out of whatever trance I was in and just scream. My mom was the first to wake up, and I tell her to look outside the window. She rushes over quickly and doesn't really understand what she's looking at. After a minute, though, the thing bends down and starts pawing at the grave with its hands. My dad and Jasper rush in, and Jasper just loses it, screams like a little girl and runs back out to the room, yelling for his father. It's outside, it came, and it's outside. I look back and see this thing is digging furiously at the ground, kicking up huge amounts of dirt. I hear these sounds of running feet through the house. I think they were looking for the shotgun. The thing reaches into the hole and grabs up what I only assume was Thomas's body by the leg in one hand. The thing kind of gallops back into the woods, snapping all these branches, and that's when we hear it. 
a kid crying, the sound of a child sobbing and crying from the direction that the thing took off in. We left as soon as the rain let up, at like 5 a.m. I don't even think we told anyone at the house. Drove straight back to Ranson, only stopping for gas. No one said a word to each other. My family refuses to speak about what happened. I tried to bring it up once, just to make sure it was real. My dad told me to shut up, so I did. I typed this up about three weeks after it happened, but just saved it to a notepad file and left it alone. Never mentioned any of it to my friends or anything. Just tried to erase it from my mind by getting absolutely messed up drunk whenever my thoughts lingered on it. It mostly worked, up until yesterday. See, I work at this gas station in Ranson, from 8pm to 3am. I work the register, keep the place clean and take out the trash. Yesterday, when I was bringing the trash bags over to the back of the building for the dude in the morning to take care of, I heard what I had assumed to be some junkie messing around in the dumpster. I yelled at whoever it was just a couple of times to get out before I would call the cops. But as I walked towards the source of the noise, I suddenly heard those same footsteps. That soft thump thump, hooves or feet, or whatever the hell they were. I turned right around and went back into the store and just hid behind the counter. I looked over at the outside security monitor and saw some kind of movement just off screen. Something huge casting a shadow and moving. Catch a glimpse of, I don't know, an elbow or something. A pale limb darting in and out of view. It had to have been the same thing. I waited for it to leave and after a while, it did. I woke up behind the counter at 6am this morning to my manager giving me this look like I'm a drug addict or something. Went home and typed the rest of this up. That's about it. It's finally about time that I released the story. My name is Brandon, and I live in Alabama. I'm about 14, and this story takes place in the year 2008, or 2009. I'm not really sure, I was quite young. So at the time, I lived with my grandmother and grandfather, which I'm not going to say exactly why. So we were beginning to move, and we were doing things around the yard, putting grass around the house. We had a few people helping my grandfather and grandmother while me and my brother played around in the street and around the house since it was not a very big house but big enough for us to have a deck on it and the back of it there is a small patch of woods just behind the house. So, me and my brother were just playing and I don't know, I just felt like something was off around the woods behind us, like something was there, keeping an eye on us, watching us. I would hear sounds of leaves and branches moving. Maybe it was the wind, maybe not. Maybe 40 or 50 minutes later, we were pretty hungry and thirsty, so we ate and later on went back to play. So when we got back, we went to play, and about 10 minutes had passed. I totally forgot about the woods, and the sounds I had heard stopped. I stopped and just looked to see if I could see something. And I walked over there, not really close, but close enough, and still nothing. It's like whatever was in there just stopped, so I didn't want to think about it even more, because I got paranoid easily and left, and didn't go back over behind the house. The next day, there was only a little grass left to cover the house, and the sun was setting, and I didn't remember to avoid the back of the house unless necessary. I was playing, and walked behind and stood. I had a feeling in that something else was there with me. 
I turned to my right, and I saw this big animal or something, like a werewolf or some sort of upright dog with yellow eyes looking at me, laying on the ground. I stood there for a few seconds and then ran to the front of the house, telling my grandparents what I just saw. Well, neither of them didn't believe me and told me to keep playing, so for the rest of the time, I just sat at the front of the house thinking that's what it was. I still don't know what it was or if it was there at all, and before I moved there, I swear I heard things outside in the woods, and sometimes have seen things. Things first started really taking off around 2010. See, my best friend lives on the outskirts of a small nearby community which is only about 10 miles away as the crow flies. There's a lot of heavy brush and forestation. It's all primarily secluded private property. The nearest neighbor is roughly a quarter mile away in both directions. One night, my best friend's girlfriend had just left his house from spending the evening with him. They were having a picnic outside in his front yard together when he had thrown an apple out in his front yard. He had taken one bite out of it, tasted that it was too sour for him, and threw it. The next morning came, and he was outside his yard, doing some cleaning up when he went to go find the apple that he accidentally left, and noticed it was gone. He didn't put a lot of thought into it. He just thought an animal had gone and taken it. After all, it was just one apple. He threw it, figuring animals would come and eat it anyway, as he often let out food around for deer and other critters far away from his house to eat. It was about a week later when he came home from work to find a dead fox on his porch. It looked like it had been strangled to death. Its eyes were literally popping out of its skull. He said the kill was fresh and wasn't sure if somebody was just trying to mess with him or what. Then he looked next to the fox and the same now rotting apple with one bite taken out of it was sitting right next to the dead fox. He began freaking out and was plenty sure that somebody was screwing with his head. He didn't call anyone though. Instead, he waited and gauge to see if anything else would happen. Time went on, and nothing else happened. These events that I just told you about happened in September, before it started to get chilly. And so fast forward about six to nine months to the following spring, just as it was getting warm again. One evening, as he was having his girlfriend over for dinner at his house, his girlfriend started screaming that there was a huge hairy man in the front lawn. He flew out and opened his door. There, standing about 50 feet away in the front yard, was this big black mass, he as he described it. It was just standing there. His eyes tried to focus in on it in the twilight of the evening, but his eyes pulled him to the object that this thing seemed to be holding in its hand. It looked to be a dead raccoon, a rather large one, too. He couldn't make out a face, definitive features, or anything else that would be specific to its description, but he said that he felt like it was staring right at him. This thing quickly darted behind a nearby tree once it realized he was looking at it. He said this creature seemed to be about five to six feet tall, if he had to guess was really bulky and very shaggy and hairy. He knew instinctually that what he had saw outside of his house was a Sasquatch. Over the next couple of days, he thought more and more about it and believed that this creature was the thing that had left the dead fox on his porch along with the apple with one bite taken out of it the previous fall. He hasn't experienced any other activity around his house or anything like that since initially sighting this in his front yard.
Hello. I have a few short experiences to tell you about. This all started when I was about 12 years old. I am 19 now. My sister Zoe, father, stepmother at the time, and her two daughters, Jade, who was my age, and Maddie, who is my sister's age, were camping. We had really only been there for a day, and everything was fine. Then me and my sisters decided we were going to go to the stream by ourselves. My father gave us a walkie-talkie, just so we can keep in contact while we were gone. Now the place we were going to was surrounded by bush, and to get there, you had to go down a little path through it. We spent a while with our shoes off and splashing in the water, when Jade said she could see something standing amongst the trees. We all looked and saw a figure. It was black, but you could tell it was the shape of a man. You couldn't see the face. We stared for a few seconds, and then it disappeared. We forgot about it and kept playing in the water, but I felt a little uneasy. A while later, we all looked back wanting to know if he was still there, and he was. Everything was silent. I could hardly hear the rapids in the little stream. We stopped looking. After about 20 minutes, we headed back to the campsite. The forest and all the noise around us was dead silent. My sisters lingered behind and I was about 20 meters ahead of them. But we couldn't see each other. I heard a twig snap behind me and I turned to look, assuming that they had caught up to me. No. I turned to see the tall, dark, black figure literally a foot behind me. So I started running. The whole time I could feel it close behind me. I ran as fast as I could until I was out in the open campground. It was gone. My sisters came out not long after I, and I told them what had happened. I asked, but none of them had seen it behind me, and they were too far behind anyway. The path was windy, so they were around a corner from me most of the time. Throughout our camping trip, we didn't see it around as much, but occasionally, we would just see this figure just standing there, watching us. Fast forward a couple years, and we go back there, with my father's new girlfriend and her daughter, Stella. I can't quite recall this trip as much, but I know for a fact that Stella saw it too. I was driving back from the coast one night when I ended up hitting this weird looking, what I can only call an animal, totaling my car in the process. This happened to me on the east coast when I was driving back from the beach. I was driving through a heavily forested area on the way back to town. It was dark and since there's thick forest on both sides of the road, it didn't allow for a lot of moonlight. There was a bend in the road and I remember as I was approaching it, this weird creature stepped out of the woods and ran right in front of my car. I hit this thing head on, and it damaged the shit out of my engine. It was all a blur looking back. I remember it running out in front of me and hitting it, but after I hit it, I don't know what happened to it. I screamed when I hit it because I tried to swerve, but unfortunately, I was unable to miss this thing. It looked pale, had a snout and I couldn't really see any fur. Then again, I only looked at it for a second before it hit my car. The entire front of my car looked like it had been hit by a moose. I didn't even know what to do, or how to process what had happened. Just make sure you're careful at night when driving, and if you see something come out onto the road, use the e-brake as best as you can.
I live right next to a Navajo reservation and have made friends with many of the people there my age. We like to hang out, play video games, and just be normal teenagers. I walk over there a lot since my best friend lives just a little less than a mile away from me. This isn't a long trek and usually only takes me about 25 to 30 minutes. I've made this trip dozens of times now and have grown very comfortable with it. I know the people along the way so I'm not scared or on the edge at all. There is a patch of forest however, about midway there. It's a little unnerving sometimes. There is always that feeling of being watched. This was a regular occurrence for me, so I tried to just ignore it and shake it off as my mind was playing tricks on me. This day, I spent more time at my friend's house than I meant to, and when I left, it was already getting dark. I reached the stretch of forest right as the sun disappeared from the sky. I shivered a little as I readied myself to begin the journey. I was ten steps in when I heard a branch snap. You know, the sound, the one that screams that there is definitely someone or something there with you. I froze, not sure of what I should do next. Should I run? Should I turn around and book it back to my friend's house? I didn't know the best option in this situation. So I whispered, Hello? Hearing my voice crack as the words fell from my lips. I don't know why I even opened my mouth, but it was out there so I listened for any reply. My heart sank when the answer came back in the sound of my own voice. Hello? I started to breathe too fast my heart pounding against my chest. I felt like I might faint. Hello? My voice came again, but not from my mouth. I wanted to run, but my feet felt cemented to the ground. I couldn't scream. I couldn't reply, as my voice echoed over and over from only a short distance away. I couldn't pinpoint exactly where it was coming from. It sounded like it was everywhere around me. Hello? It repeated. Stop it! I finally managed to tear from my lips. Everything went silent. For a long minute, nothing happened. The air only grew stale, and I realized for the first time there were no typical forest sounds. There were no bugs, no frogs, or crickets. Nothing. I stood there, terrified, waiting to see what could happen next. Stop it! It mimicked back. I'd had enough and was willing for my heavy legs to move. Before I could take a step, I heard rustling in the bushes only twenty feet to my left. I watched in horror as a deer head with huge antlers protruded through the bush. As it came further out and stood up on twos, I took off. I flew out of those woods and all the way home in record time. I said nothing to my mom when I got there. I just went up to my room, laid down, and thought about what happened. My mother came in at some point and asked me if everything was alright. I replied yes, that I was just tired. I don't know why I didn't tell her. I guess I might have just been afraid of how she would react. I called my friend and told him everything. He freaked out and told me that no matter what happened that night, to not reply or look out my window. This terrified me even more. He said to call him the next morning and he would explain more, and that he had to speak to his grandfather as soon as possible. That night I didn't sleep. I stayed awake listening to every little sound the night brought. Around 3 a.m., just as I was about to drift off, I noticed the air changed, the night sounds quieted. I felt my heart begin to pound. I lay there and waited, pulling the covers up over my head like a child, 
far too scared to move. It came after a long moment. Hello? I cried. It was all I could do. Hello? Stop it! It mocked what I had said in the woods again. It was terrifying enough when it copied what I said. But then, it did something new. It called my name. Amy. My mother's voice. Amy. Amy, come here. Hello? Stop it! My voice again. For the rest of the night, the creature outside my window called my name in my mother's voice and repeated what I said in the woods, over and over. In the morning, when the sun broke through the dark, it finally stopped. I fell into a fitful sleep. I woke around noon to my friend calling to tell me that he had spoken to his grandfather and could explain what had happened to me. He said there was a creature called the Yi Neladushi who goes on all fours. He explained that it was an evil witch that used dark magic to transform into an animal with the attributes it required and that it had caught my scent and knew me now. I was also given a warning that since it knew me, it would always follow me, that I would always have to be careful. Last night, I heard scratching on my window, then a low hum. The creature began saying my name again, but also adding in things I hadn't said in my mother's voice. At one point, it started calling my name, but drawing it out really like, Amy. It tried to get me to come inside, or open the door, and let it in. This went on all night. At this point, I feel like I'm going crazy. I don't know what to do. Is it seriously going to stalk the shadows around me for the rest of my life? I don't think I can handle that. I've been seeing some really freaky stuff out at my uncle's ranch outside of Flagstaff. I should probably preface this a little. I'm very close with my uncle, and my parents were, let's just say, unable to properly take care of me when I was in my teens. So, I went to go live with my uncle for a few years until I turned 18. Things, for the most part, were pretty normal. However, at night, things seemed to take a turn for the worst, and it only progressively got worse. This is actually kind of hard for me to type out because I know a lot of you probably won't believe me, but I didn't believe this stuff either until I saw it with my own eyes. There are a few times at night I would see bizarre things, evil things. Sometimes they would be these weird lights in the sky, far off in the distance, accompanied by weird noises. Everything from screams, howls, bangs, and booms. Sometimes, I would hear weird banging on our house and windows while we were trying to sleep. I remember one night specifically. I woke up to the horses freaking out. Something had spooked them. My uncle at the time was gone, so it was my job to tend things when he wasn't there. I'm only 16 at the time, so I had to man up real quick and grab a flashlight to go see what was going on. As I am making my way to the stalls, I practically screamed in terror as I see this, what I can only describe as a 10 foot tall bear looking thing run off in the distance. It almost had the face of something that would resemble a bear. It had a snout, but it was hunched over with its arms and hands curled closer to its body, but it was running on two feet. It was dark, and this thing moved so fast I couldn't get a really good look at it. Even though that I can give you the above details, I also noticed that it had unusual eye shine. Actually, I would say it had more like an eye glow than anything else. I remember I screamed out loud, What the fuck was that? 
I quickly made it into the stalls, and the horses were freaking the hell out. I spent some time trying to calm them all down, and eventually got them calmed down enough and went back to the house. It was almost 3 in the morning. I was so freaked out by the whole ordeal, I wasn't able to just fall right back asleep. I kept hearing weird noises off in the distance, and what sounded like heavy thudding that would come close to the house and then stop. Like if somebody wore huge boots and sprinted right up to the house and then just stopped. I'm really not sure how else to describe it. There's been other times we've seen a weird blue light off in the distance and weird noises that happen at the same time. I remember another time when my uncle was home and this happened to be in the evening when the sun was setting. I remember sitting out in the living room with my uncle and this weird pale looking face pops up in the window staring at us. It didn't have a nose, but it did have sharp teeth and weird reptilian like eyes. I froze in terror. My uncle jumps up and grabbed his rifle and bolts out the door. This thing disappeared. I sat there, gritting my teeth in total anxiety and utter silence. It wasn't long before the silence was broken by my uncle's gunshots and him screaming. I knew I had to go help, so I got up and before I can make it to the door, he comes running back in, slamming the door behind him and locking it. He was bleeding profusely on his left arm. I can't tell if he was clawed or bitten, but what I had to do was go run and tear up a shirt to use it as a bandage to stop the bleeding. It was that bad. I remember asking him if I should call 911, and he quickly told me not to, that it was a waste of time. Things had subsided after that, and the rest of the evening calmed itself down. It was later revealed to me that he's been having weird issues and things showing up on his property long before I'd ever shown up there, and he's called 911 and the police out there before. Of course, they're never able to find any evidence of such things happening, and have threatened to arrest him and detain him again if he calls 911 one more time. Okay. Before I tell you this, I need you to know that this is the absolute truth. I saw this, my friends and I saw this, I don't have an explanation for what we witnessed, but it was what it was. It was a Friday night and me and my girlfriends decided we would have a good time having some drinks and playing cards against humanity. We're all 21, so we wanted to have a good girls night out. We began having some drinks and playing card games when the only sober one who hadn't started drinking yet had suggested we go pick up her friend because she's got tons more good booze. We only had beer and we wanted to get pretty hammered. We decided that would be a great idea. Most of us had had only one beer at this point and the girl that mentioned this hadn't even drank yet. So. We all piled into her car, since there was only five of us in total, and began the drive toward her friend's house. Her friend lives in the next town over, and in between the two towns is a lot of farmland, agriculture, stuff like that. There's a part in the road where it wraps around this huge apple orchard. The way we had to get to this girl's house was by driving around this thing. It was dark, but the moon was shining bright and was illuminating much of the area around. It was creepy enough as it was. As we were driving, I was already looking into the orchard, seeing the one hundreds of trees and huge lot of all the apple harvesting, and I saw what looked to come straight out of my nightmare. We were driving about 30 miles an hour on this road because, well, it was dark, and off into the orchard was this thing approaching the car quickly. It was tall, looked to be in a torn up leather like coat or something, 
but I could definitively see that it had long claws. The only thing I remember about its face was it had orange glowing eyes, and the face looked extremely disfigured with its mouth hanging open. It didn't look like an animal, bear, dog, etc. It was very humanoid looking. I saw this thing with its mouth open running in our car, with its claws outstretched toward us, and I began losing my shit. I was screaming, and the other girls looked over and saw what I saw, and began screaming, and all of us losing our shit together. The driver saw, and she almost drove us off the road, she was so terrified. She slammed on the gas, and we were easily doing 70. To her horror, she looked in the rearview mirror, and this thing was following our car, and keeping up with it. It was closing in on the car when we approached the turn we needed to make to get to her friend's house. Instead, we just kept going straight, trying to shake this thing from our tail. Remember that where we are, there's nothing else around. There was just large, vast fields all around us used for various types of farming and agriculture. No houses even. We're way the hell out here. We had passed a large bend in the road, going in the total opposite direction that we needed to, and it looked like after some time, this thing disappeared and stopped following our car. We were all still freaking the hell out, wondering what on earth was that thing that had followed the car. I think we just kept driving for about another 30 minutes before finally stopping at some abandoned well, or what we thought of the time was abandoned gas station, and deciding how the hell we were going to get back home. We certainly didn't want to go the way we came, but it was the only real way to go. It certainly didn't help the gas station we pulled into was creepy as hell, and virtually no one else around. We decided to all pile into the gas station and potentially ask for help, get water, and try to calm down. We went inside and told the guy behind the counter we were being followed by some weird-ass creature, and it chased our vehicle. He seemed freaked out, but also in a little bit disbelief and not sure why five girls were in his gas station shop freaking the hell out. An older gentleman who had happened to pull into the gas station just happened to come in and overhear us. He seemed really concerned. He seemed like a very nice, genuine old man who wanted to help out. He told us and offered that he would drive behind us all the way home to make sure that we're safe. He had told us that he wanted to talk to us outside before we left. The clerk inside wished us luck. When he pulled us outside, he looked around, had a panicked look on his face, and asked us where we saw what we did. We had told him what had happened again, and he told us he's seen it too, that there's something that Orchard draws in, a negative, evil energy. He says that ever since they built it, he's felt a weird energy coming around that area. Then he went on to tell us the history. I guess a long time ago, before they built the Orchard there, before they had even cleared out all the property, there was a lot of occultism going on. The land had been privately owned, and it was primarily used for black magic and evil worship that had supposedly been going on for years and years. He even told us that there was rumors of human sacrifice that had taken place. He says because of the thick forestation that that property used to hold, it made the perfect place for black magic rituals and occult meetups. He told us that at some point the land had been purchased, cleared out, and the orchard was put there in its place. Weird sightings of things had been reported since, and all of that really gave us the creeps. We felt safer with him, assuring that we'd be able to get through the area safe and sound. We got on the road and he followed closely behind us. It was getting pretty late at night. I was pissed that a fun girl's night out had turned into a freaking horror movie. We made our way back to the area near the orchard 
and we'd sped up to get past there as fast as we could. We made it back into town, and the old man, who I won't mention his name, waved at us outside of his truck window and took off in a different direction. It's wonderful when you meet genuinely nice strangers who want to help you. We made it back safely to our house, called it a night. All the other girls went home. It's so weird because the area in which we went that night, none of us ever really go. At least for me, since I have no reason to ever go out that way. I didn't sleep well that night, and I couldn't get over the fear and panic of what we had seen and just knowing the evil that resided in that area. We didn't get any weird vibes or felt bad, but it disturbs me that those things could have gone on. One thing is for certain, though. I made sure to stay far the hell away from that area, and I'll never go near that orchard again. Creatures are all around us. We might not see them, but they can see us. They lurk in the depths of the shadows, the wilderness, or even outside of our windows. The stories I'm about to share with you tonight are encounters with strange and bizarre creatures not of this world. Enjoy. A couple of years ago, I was in the woods in Kentucky, hiking and looking for ginseng. I stopped to search the ground and I saw a small stone roll past me. I look up and saw another land about six feet away from me. At first, I'm thinking nothing of it, but was just curious to figure out what was going on. I move up on the hill about a hundred feet and again a small stone lands beside me. I start looking around again, and then all of a sudden, it was just raining down small stones all around me. By small, I mean really small, like pebbles almost. The hair on my neck stands up, and I get a terrible, I am in danger kind of feeling. I immediately start heading down off the mountain, while loads of little rocks are falling all around me. I kept thinking I saw shadows or something moving quickly between the trees, but never actually saw whatever it was. I have to add that I was on my very own private property, and no one was around for miles and miles. It's a very, very secluded area, and none of the rocks actually hit me. This is my first time posting, and I've never told anyone about this experience before. Hey guys, I live in northern Michigan and I've had a lot of weird experiences, so here's a pretty tame experience to start off. My parents own a 10 acre property and a good half of it is made up of woods that backs up to a national forest. It was pretty early in the evening, so there was still light out when we were coming up the driveway. Once we were a good 15 feet away from their garage, we saw this black thing or animal run in front of our car and into the grassy field to the left of our driveway. It was a quadruped and about the size of a medium dog. It was really fast so I didn't get a good look at its face, but I know it had a long skinny tail and had no fur. From what I could tell, it had back legs much like a dog, but ran more like a cat. It sort of bounced more than it ran, if you can picture that in your head at all. We brushed it off at first, thinking maybe it was just my mother's dog. That is, until her dog came out of the garage. The dog didn't react to this thing at all. This event happened a few months ago, and we recently had my parents over for dinner, and while we were talking about weird experiences, 
My mom mentioned how her and my father have been seeing this black thing walking out in the neighbor's tree line, and they haven't been able to get a great look at it, but they have no clue what it could be. We assume what we saw was the same things my parents have been seeing. My father had also mentioned there being a time when he was out on a trail in the woods all by himself, and he heard something growl at him, and it scared him enough to go back to the house. I can't say if this was related though. If anyone has any theories or knows of any animals that this thing could possibly be, please let me know. Thank you in advance. My dad is a massive nerd and alien enthusiast and would always talk to me about the probability of existence of other intelligent life. As a child, I was equally fascinated, but never really scared, and always wondered about my own chances of maybe meeting an alien. At the time of my encounter, I was seven or maybe eight years old, and had never really known about abductions or aliens being scary. To me, they were just something neat. Because of how my house is situated, I always figured that it would be difficult for any visitors, so to speak, to find good parking because the terrain was very steep with dense pine forest. I live in a small town in Colorado, and my house is in a valley on top of a hill, closely wedged into the side of a mountain. My street is extremely quiet, and there are only three homes that were very close to my own, and they were all vacation homes. So, they were usually vacant. There are no lights on my street, and it gets basically zero traffic. So, there is never anyone around other than my own family. When this all happened, I still shared a room with my sister, who was notoriously a heavy sleeper, known to sleep through fire alarms, thunderstorms, and everything. Meanwhile, I was a very light sleeper, and I still am. At some point, I began suddenly feeling extremely scared. This feeling of fear and dread became a regular occurrence, happening once, sometimes twice a week. I was never a kid who worried about monsters under the bed or in the closet, so it was weird that I suddenly started feeling like there was something else in the room with me. At night, I would hear the door handle turn followed by strange chirping sounds that would stop as soon as I moved. The sound scared me and I began sleeping completely under the covers, making sure none of me was exposed to the outside world. Soon after I began sleeping like this, I would feel something tapping the covers. Oftentimes, the tapping and chirping happened together and like always stopped if I moved around. Now anyone could chalk this up to the imagination of a seven-year-old, and that's what my parents thought, and honestly, sometimes I wonder if that's really all it was. But then I think about one particular night that makes me nearly certain that there was something other than my sister in the room. One night, my parents went out for dinner and hired a babysitter. It was a very normal night, and the sitter was super nice. She read us a bedtime story and actually ended up falling asleep herself. She was on my sister's bed, which was in the middle of the room, and my bed was up against the wall that had the door to go out of the room. Because the babysitter was there, I felt safer, safe enough to sleep with my head above the covers. I was still a little scared, so I struggled to fall asleep and ended up staring at the wall for quite a while. It was at this time that I felt the sudden fear and impending doom. The door handle turned, making its little sounds as the door was slowly pushed open. I was paralyzed with fear, too afraid to move and hide under the covers because I thought the sudden movement might put me in danger. A tall, white thing slinked into the room. It was around seven feet tall, super thin. Its skin was sort of translucent and had a greenish-gray hue, an extremely muted version 
of the glow of those glow-in-the-dark stars that you put on the bedroom ceilings. Its head was in a super dramatic angular teardrop shape. It was more of a really long slight pear shape, still rounded, super sunken in with defined bone structure and heavy shadows. Its eyes were like empty voids, no reflection or obvious dimension. They really just seemed like large holes in its face, empty sockets. There were no visible eyelids, a small narrow bump of the nose and small undefined slit where the mouth was. Its arms and torso were very thin and long, but I couldn't see its fingers from where I was. It moved very quickly and fluidly, going right to my sister's bed. It started for a bit. Maybe it was confused by the presence of the babysitter. It simply watched, moving around the bed, ever so slowly. I was horrified. I wanted to scream and run and hide, but I was too scared. All I could do was stare as it circled my sister's bed. After a couple of minutes, it left, quickly making its way back to the door, slipping out of my room, closing the door as it left. It paid no attention to me during the entirety of the encounter, and when it was out of the room, I heard a couple chirps, quickly followed by silence. At this point, I was finally able to bury myself under the blankets, where I eventually passed out. My sister and I never got hurt, and I don't think they ever did much more than observe. I'm certain that my sister didn't even know because she was such a heavy sleeper. In hindsight, I think it was mostly interested in my sister, and I don't feel its presence in my room very often since we stopped sharing rooms. I'm not really sure what it was. I don't feel like it 100% fits the common gray description but I feel like it's similar enough. This experience I had still affects me today, and while I don't suffer from any crippling fear or PTSD, I still occasionally get really scared. I still sleep completely under the covers, and I always make sure I have a flashlight with me under the covers, just in case of an emergency. I really don't think there was any malicious intent with this thing at all but I'm scared anyways. I wish I could just brush it off as an over inactive imagination or as sleep paralysis, but I don't think that's what it was. I still occasionally hear the chirping and feel the tapping. I wonder why it visits sometimes. I think it just likes to check up on the kid who it saw every once in a while. Maybe one day I will muster up the courage to try and confront it if it's ever around. little background on where I am before I jump into the encounter. I'm stationed in Arizona. I live on base in the dorms, and in these dorms, the rooms are a bit small. I live in 10 by 10 with a door leading into the shared kitchen bathroom with my roommate. This adjoining door is very heavy and makes an audible sort of shh when closed. On the door is a deadbolt on my side of the door. To keep my roommate out, obviously. When the deadbolt is turned either way, the metal clicks into and out of place very loudly. And in a 10 by 10 room, this sound is obnoxiously loud. At the time of this occurrence, my roommate had been gone for two weeks for training. Nobody was in the room with me in my dorm. Another side note, everybody keeps their adjoining door locked 24 seven because who wants someone busting in on their room? I'm definitely one of those that keeps the deadbolt in place, unless I'm actively in the kitchen or using the bathroom. The deadbolt only locks from my side of the door. Keep this in mind. I fell asleep around 8 a.m. Saturday from staying awake all night, and I had a dream. It was a movie night in my dad's room for our family. So, both my brothers had their little inflatable mattress on the floor on the far side of my dad's bedroom on the side of his bed furthest from the door. Nothing really weird about the movie. We watched it and then it was time for bed. My brothers were passed out on the mattress asleep and my stepmom was asleep holding my dad. I was leaning up against my dad's bed, back facing the doorway with one leg on the ground 
and one leg leaned on the mattress, kind of folded in at my stomach for some reason. My dad and I are just talking about something random, keeping our tones hushed so we don't wake the rest of the family. When we both completely freeze mid-sentence, we heard someone wheezing. Don't ask me why, but for some reason, we both knew it wasn't either one of my brothers. It was coming from beneath the bed. We were frozen, eyes locked on each other, listening to this rasping for what felt like minutes. Finally, I was able to move and realized too late that my leg was asleep. I fell down off the bed because of this, and I landed on the ground with a thud, smacking my head on the hardwood. The wheezing continued, louder now. I can't really explain what the wheezing sounded like. It was definitely lacking a rhythm, and sounded literally like someone was forcing their breathing. I opened my eyes and realized I was searching the darkness under the bed, crazily, for some shadow or movement. As soon as my eyes locked onto a body, I started screaming, go away, go away, go away, maybe 10 to 20 times. I realized I couldn't move again. My eyes were locked only on a shadowy figure, unmoving. After I finished repeating my screams at the shadow, I felt a sudden release. The wheezing had stopped, and I could finally move again. But I felt super heavy, like my body was absolutely exhausted. I stood up as fast as I could and launched myself onto the bed with my father. My dad's eyes were very big, and the white stood out to me in the darkness of the room. For some reason, it made my fear rise further into my throat. We lay there, clutching each other, literally frozen with fear. Like that fear you get that makes you breathe immensely quiet, I strained against the darkness in search of something. Primal fear. If I move, I die. We sat like that for minutes, but it felt like hours. We were starting to feel a bit relaxed as we hadn't heard the rasping breath for a while. When something very tall and very emaciated stood from the other side of the bed I'd fallen at. It was so dark in the room, I could only make out a shadow, so I couldn't see any coloration or definite details. Just a very shadowy tall figure. I could only make out the face, really. I would draw it so maybe you guys can see what it looks like. My dad and I didn't breathe at all. We waited for it to move, but it just stood there, two feet away. I assumed it was watching us. The wheezing had begun again. After what felt like literally hours of watching this creature, just listening to the strained wheezing and staring at it, it started to loom over the bed. A long hand outreached towards me. The thing had spindly like fingers. No claws, but like weird pointy fingertips. Very skinny wrist and joints on the hand. I woke up as the creature touched me. My body is extremely heavy now. I feel absolutely drained, and my eyelids are heavy from exhaustion. I pick up my phone to look around in the darkness of my room and see that somehow... I've managed to sleep until Sunday at 3.33 a.m. I know what this means, as I've grown up watching all the typical scary horror movies, reading the scary stories, etc. I start to feel that thick fear rise in my throat again. My eyes welt with tears and I'm ready to turn my phone flashlight on to scan the room thoroughly when I hear my connecting door to the kitchen slide closed and lock. I feel myself stiffen from fear and I widened my eyes in the darkness, trying to see what could have closed my door. Now, these doors are very heavy like I said before, and have a distinct sound when closed. Deadbolt is heavy metal and makes a loud noise when moved, kind of like a metal pang. I couldn't see anything in the darkness, and had to literally hold my eyelids open because I was feeling so weighed down. After turning on my phone flashlight and seeing nothing, I got up and turned all the lights on. I'm too scared to go back to sleep now. The shadows being cast in my room seem to move when I look away from them, so I've turned on all the lights. It's now Tuesday, and I have not slept since. My skin is crawling from the feeling of being stared at as if any form of lights are turned off. I will be doomed. 
I awoke in a sweat puddle, feeling as though I had been through hell, and I just literally have tears streaming to my face typing this. But I need to get this down, so maybe I can get some answers. I have attached what is a drawing of what I've seen. I have an experience I have told many people about, and no one believes me except my family. This makes me think that they have had similar experiences themselves. They believe talking about these things welcomes them. My family had a ranch growing up in Northern Cali. It's been in our family since the early 1900s. It's surrounded by forest, about a hundred feet away from the house. Cowboys would pay to take a bath on their travel and sleep in the stable. There is still a sign up there for the baths. We converted that stable into a home after the original house my grandfather built burnt down in the 50s. Very isolated. My whole life we would spend weekends up there. No phone. No cable. Just electricity. If you got hurt or cut your hand in the wood splitter, tough luck. It's an hour to town. It was very basic necessities. Wood-burning stove. Old appliances with everything. Despite growing up, there we always carried guns, even to the bathroom that was connected to the house, but you had to go out the front door to get to it. It wasn't an outhouse, but kind of. As kids, we always had to be in groups of three or one kid and one adult. I had little things happen that terrified me, but always told not to acknowledge it. When I was 21, my grandfather was having a hard time staying there all weekend, and I loved it up there so much, I moved in with my dog. He was a big, staffy pit bull, and went everywhere with me in my tiny red 1993 Miata. I loved that car. This was around 2009. My cell phone worked up there, but I had to set it on this specific shelf and it was pretty inconsistent at times with text, but I could always call out standing on a chair by the shelf. I had a boyfriend who was an asshole. He came up every day, but he never slept over. It was scary up there. I would watch movies and listen to the radio. Not having cable even added to the isolation. So, one day, it's super windy but the power, by some miracle, was staying on. There was one light above the barn that barely reached my house. It had two front doors, one in the kitchen and one in my room on the same side of the house, about 15 to 20 feet apart. My dog starts going crazy. I assume it's either the wind or a mountain lion. I wasn't about to let him out. The screen is kind of rattling with everything else, and then I hear it right outside of my door. I swear on my son, I heard a tiny voice say, Hello. With another pause. Hello. Pause. Hello. It sounded like a very small person, but not a child. No knocking. No response to anything I said. Just the same word over and over, but like they were trying to get it right. The L's sounded like R's. I was so petrified and my dog is freaking out with his hair up. I'm calling my boyfriend, crying, and he is on the way, but it's like an hour to get here, and everyone loses service on the way up. I called my grandfather, and he was so mad, saying grab the gun, and do not open the door by any means. I was crying and begging for it to answer. I asked if it needed help. Does it want my phone? I was so scared that it would only say hello. Everything felt so wrong. I did not try and peek out the window. It was older glass. The kind that looks uneven, if that makes sense. It's very easily broken. My boyfriend arrived first, then my uncle. Before they got there, it became less and less. And then nothing. There's no way a person was wandering out there. The way to my stoop was all mud. The stable is kind of on a small cliff. So walking to the stoop where the stairs are is uphill from the house. No footprints, animal or human are in the mud. Nothing touched or taken, not even from the fridge that was outside near the bathroom area. I moved back to town not long after that. I never slept there again. The way my uncle acted when he got there 
It was like he knew there was nothing to be found, and he didn't ask me many questions at all. He told me to keep my dog on a leash, and that was it. No one talked about it the next day, except me. I know there are amazing Wendigos, skinwalkers, horrible creatures that lurk in the night. These beings aren't like other cryptids covered. These creatures come for you. They try to lure you in. Will you be pulled in and be a victim to one of these evil beings? Or will you be able to break free of their spell? Tonight, we're going to look at several skinwalker and wendigo encounters. Enjoy. To start this off, there are zero bear, moose, or elk where I lived at the time. Background info. At the time, I was around 12 or 14, and I was with my friend who I'll call Kayla. We planned on going to a picnic in her pastures. As we walked up a smaller hill, Kayla pushed me to the ground and whispered to me, Do you see that? At least 20 or so feet away was a tall creature. It stood on four thin limbs and its head was narrow, similar to that of a horse or a deer. It was completely black. I couldn't make out features, but it had a mane just like a lion, but it seemed flat and coarse. The mane, like fur, ran along its back, stopping near the rear. It had no tail. Here's a side note. All of the cattle were moved to a completely different area. Nowhere near this one. No other livestock animals were in those pastures. But this thing was just staring off. Suddenly, my friend stood up and made a beeline for the exit that was at least two miles away. I didn't hesitate to follow her. We finally stopped near the latched fence that led to her house and looked back. We had a pretty good view of the hill it stood on. It was slowly walking back into the trees. This still gives me chills to this day. Okay, so, Friday, 1.28 a.m., me and my friends decided to go for a drive. We sometimes like to go to the Yano Mountains to experience something that only happens in that area, paranormal and supernatural. Like any other time we do this, we go in my car and drive past Tome Hill. Going towards the mountains and park across from VHS about a mile and a half away. Then we sit and take in the scenic beauty of the dark desert. Starting by listen closely to anything, and looking everywhere, being hyper-observant. At first, we saw a light in the distance, traveling flat on the desert land, getting within about a mile away from us, then disappearing altogether. Moving on from where we had, I mean, I had to see something else. Driving through roads and flying by at least 30 miles an hour over the speed limit, we turned down a familiar road. This is where we knew that something was about to change me and everyone else. We all looked to the right side of the car, and we all saw what we believed to be something like a skinwalker. A massive black dog just hunched over at my car while I was going 45 miles an hour through the road. We should have felt impact from the massive creature, but we didn't. Both people in the back seat looked and saw this thing rise up from the ground and stand straight up on two legs, absolutely huge and all black with red eyes that are forever imprinted in my mind. I didn't slow down, but sped up, going about 55 miles an hour now, so probably about 20 yards away they saw it rise up, as if nothing happened to it. Before I begin, I'm a 16-year-old male. About three years ago, I was in Virginia visiting my family over the summer. 
We were right outside the DC area and staying in a two-story house near the freeway. On the other side of the freeway was a forest. So, my mom, her boyfriend Eric, and I were all staying with Eric's parents. We had brought some night vision binoculars and decided that tonight was the perfect time to use them. So, after dinner, we geared up and we headed out. We pass under the freeway and head into the woods. When we get about five minutes into the forest, we set down our bag and we take out our binoculars. My mom looks around with them for quite a while, seeing a few squirrels here and there. She gets tired of them and eventually passes them on to me. I look around for a while, being careful not to look at the freeway for fear of being blinded. I spot something behind a tree about 50 feet to our left. I concentrate on it, trying to figure out what it is. It looks like a pale, bald, anorexic man looking straight at us from behind a tree. I get a bit uneasy, but I'm hesitant to believe it's really there. I ask Eric to take a look, just in case. To my despair, he sees it too. He describes it much the same way I did. Now, Eric is a former amateur boxer, and I train MMA almost every day, but neither one of us wants to stick around with that thing. We start heading back to the house, crossing under the freeway. We take another look behind us as a car comes by. All three of us see glowing eyes lit up by the headlights on the other side of the freeway. We say fuck that and we head back to the house. When we get back, Eric's parents are asleep and my mom and Eric go upstairs to the guest room. There's only one guest room, so I have the couch downstairs. I'm a little too excited after seeing the thing in the woods, so I end up staying up all night. Around 3 a.m., I'm watching TV and I start hearing footsteps above me. I immediately remember our earlier encounter and I panic a little. I try to calm down and tell myself it's just one of the dogs or maybe someone who couldn't sleep. I keep hearing the footsteps though, for a while actually, until I hear a doorknob jiggle. I find it weird that they're trying to open a locked door, but I try to ignore it. They stop, walk around for a few more minutes, and then it's quiet again. I stay up until the sun starts coming up, and then I pass out. My mom wakes me up, and I remember the footsteps from the night before. I describe what happened and ask if one of them got up at any time. She says no, and I think it must have been one of the dogs. That is, until she tells me the room above me is the office. No one was in the office and the door stays locked at night. My heart sinks as I piece it all together. I don't know if it was that thing for sure, but I think it was. I've done a lot of research since then, trying to figure out what that was that night. I found two creatures that seemed to match it. I think it was either a skinwalker or possibly a wendigo. Whichever one it was, I'm just thankful that door was locked. I know I wouldn't be able to fight that thing, no matter how tough I am. To start this story off, and to give a little insight about me, I'm an 18-year-old female who grew up in Michigan and have lived in the country for as long as I can remember. And for heads up in this, this is a long story, so please, bear with me. Now, back to the story. On one particular hot summer weekend, me and a couple of friends, including my boyfriend, let's call him Tony, and my older brother, let's call him Brad, decided we were going to do some camping for the weekend, since it was such a nice warm week. Tony's parents had owned a cabin way out in Lettington, surrounded by a huge wooded area with a personal lake and no neighbors for at least four miles. But 
Being stupid teenagers, we didn't really think about that. All we were ready for was to party like any normal teenagers would. Well, after being there for two hours, our fun had started. Tony's friends had brought ton of alcohol and weed to last us for the weekend, so we wouldn't be bored since we had no service and only movies to watch. After it got around 12 a.m. and was pitch black, we had a huge bonfire going. It was a total of six people, including me and Tony. As we talked and laughed about coming up events in our lives, we were so distracted that we didn't even notice that my brother had literally frozen his eyes to one section of the woods. Mind you, we were all intoxicated and high at the time. Eventually, our talking ceased when Tony realized his friend and my brother had an emotionless expression. Hey, dude, you alright? He asked Brad. Silence. Brad didn't reply or even make any movements that would indicate he heard him. After that, I started to get scared, as well as the other two girls there. It took a lot for my brother to act that way. Eventually, I was the first to catch on what he was excessively staring into a certain spot in the woods. I turned my head and followed his gaze the best I could. And when I finally caught on to what he was staring at, my heart dropped. There, right fucking there, was at first look a dog. At least, that's what I thought. It was some person's dog that had wandered off. But then my brain kicked in and I realized there wasn't neighbors for miles. So how could there be a dog? My mind started to race while Tony still tried to get Brad to speak even more. In one motion, this thing stood up tall. And when I say tall, I mean gigantic. It had to be at least six feet tall. Everyone has seen it then. How could you not? The other two girls and the other boy with us gasped as they finally grasped why my brother was still as hell. No one moved for what seemed like hours. Tony was the first to talk. No tail, he mumbled. No one heard what he said but Brad. And I swear to you, when I say his eyes widen as big as pan saucers, that freaked me out immediately. What did you say? One of the girls had asked. It has no fucking tail, he hissed at her. My heartbeat stopped. He was right. There was no tail on this thing. Suddenly, my clouded alcohol mind cleared up in a fraction of a second when I finally realized that what this thing was exactly. Now, I understand why my brother was basically shitting his pants. This thing was a skinwalker. My instincts kicked in right then and there, but before I could nope the fuck out of there, this thing let off a terrible stench like rotting meat before screaming inhuman-like. The sound was enough to scare the hell out of everyone. My brother was the first up out of his chair and started shouting native words out to the creature and why I told everyone to get the hell inside. No one questioned me when they seen just how dead serious I was, especially Tony. He's never seen me so scared, so he knew it was a bad situation. We all hightailed it into the cabin with my brother in tow, still shouting native words at the creature, which seemed to keep it at bay, while I gave us enough time to get inside. He slammed and locked the door before turning all the lights off and grabbing a special ash from the kitchen counters and started throwing it at every window and door, all while chanting. Of course, he had everyone freaked out and basically in tears at that moment. After he was done, no one said a word for a long time. All of us were still in shock. He grabbed our dad's pistol and had it posted by him for hours. 
everyone was entirely too shaken up to even question what happened. We must have fallen asleep eventually because I woke up to my brother packing all of our stuff into two cars early in the morning. I understood why. We had native family. We knew what we were dealing with and we knew it would come back and maybe, just maybe, not alone. Before we left, I did a blessing on the cabin and spoke a few calming words to the still, very freaked out young girls. We left as soon as everything was packed up. To this day, we still haven't explained exactly to our friends what happened that night, and they never bothered to ask us either. I'm having a hard time remembering the stories told to me by my Navajo family, but when I Skype with them again, I will ask for me. This creepy set of events happened directly to me though, so here goes. My first personal encounter. I know it's lengthy, but hey, skinwalkers, they do require a backstory. It started when my two brothers, who we'll call David and Luke, and Luke's girlfriend, who we will call Sarah, all drove down to the desert to spend some time out in the country. This is reservation land, as it were, so red dirt was everywhere. This was in southern Utah, a majestically beautiful place if you ever get the chance to visit. We had some pistols and decided to go out and target practice. We took our gear and some old targets to a place called Devil's Heartbeat. I had never been, but all three of them were familiar with the area. It was a canyon about 200 or so feet deep. We stayed on one end of the canyon, by the drop-offs, and to our left was the ravine. About 50 feet over, the opposite side of the canyon rose up above us, where some other ruins were. The Navajo may disagree with historians on the Anasazi's origin and departure. According to Navajo legend, they simply disappeared from existence, leaving behind plates, dishes, food, and went into another dimension, or some equivalent. But, whatever the history, the Navajo do not like to wander in the ruins. I never asked why, but figured it had something to do with disrespect, preserving history, etc. As such, none of the others cared a bit about these canyon ruins. They were more interested in shooting pistols. I could see old beds, ladders, and even cave drawings on the cliffs with just my naked eye. And I got this strange, strange fixation on going over there. I'm not Navajo and felt that their rules didn't apply to me. I set down the cliffs without a rope and decided I would climb down, cross the canyon floor, and then climb back up. This was a bad idea for a million reasons, but it was just like some obsession. I can't explain the feeling. It was the magneticism. I wanted to be in those ruins, and it wasn't just a touristy-like curiosity. It felt like I was meant to go there. I kept slipping and kept getting stuck on the rocks. I was so frustrated I almost started crying. Finally, I was deterred by the unmistakable sound of a growl coming from the canyon floor below me. There were trees down there, so I couldn't see what was making the growl, but a mountain lion immediately rose to my mind and I got my ass back up to the cliffside. I said nothing to the others, and we shot guns for a while. The only other strange occurrence was while Sarah was aiming, things got eerily quiet. We all heard a sound from behind us, maybe 20 feet away. It was almost a growl, but then a hoarse laugh, almost like a lion, and then a hyena. We had a clear view of the entire area, and there was nothing, certainly not on the cliff tops where we had heard it anyway. The creepy part was that while David, Sarah, and I all heard it from a close distance, 
Luke heard the exact same noise right by his ear. We ended up camping out there to see if anything would happen, and this is when I got completely terrified. Before, I was only scared of wild animals. We had guns though and were sleeping with no bags or tents, just some blankets under the stars and a little flare, so I felt safe when we all laid down. I fell asleep pretty quickly, but woke up a few hours later to see everyone else lying with their eyes wide open, listening. The canyon was completely full of noise. The only way to describe it is people banging rocks together. There would be one set maybe 300 yards away, then another clacking 200 yards away, and then 50 yards away. The canyon echoes, so it was hard to tell exactly how many rock smacking rock noises there were going on, but they sounded like Morse code. We listened to this for maybe 10 minutes. No other animal noises. Nothing. Finally, David, who is kind of a hard ass and the least superstitious, shouted, Shut up! And everything immediately stopped. My heart was in my throat. We just sat there and stared at one another, wide-eyed. It was dead quiet. And then we heard another super weird noise from the ruins. I don't know how to explain this one either, but it kind of sounded like a zebra noise. Like these squeaky trills. It got louder, and then the rocks, sticks, whatever they were, started up again. But this was worse, because now other animal noises came. We heard what sounded like wolves or coyotes barking, monkeys screeching. In my opinion, those were the most terrifying. Owls hooting, and through it all, the terrible zebra noises. We said nope, and got our happy little asses out of there immediately. It took us maybe 10 minutes to douse that fire, pack our blankets, and speed away. And the noises were continuing the entire time. That night, I was obviously pretty shaken up. Before I could fall asleep again, my Navajo mother came and sat by me and said that she could tell I had a rough day. We hadn't mentioned the creepy shit to avoid a lecture about fucking with spirits. She asked me about it, and I ended up spilling my guts about not seeing the canyon ruins. It was something personal. It felt like it. I wanted to go there. So why couldn't I? It would have been beautiful. After I told her all about it, I could see that she had a really concerned look on her face. What is it? I asked, totally confused, and she explained something I had no idea about. The spirits in the ruins like to lure people up. When they get up on the ground, the spirits push them off. That's why we don't go there. I remained creeped out for the remainder of the visit. The town has a public access kiva, kind of a tourist trap for a little podunk place. But since I didn't see the ruins up close, I went down into the kiva, and I went alone, as of course my superstitious family refused to enter other natives' dwellings. I figured that nothing could push me off a cliff if I was in a kiva. I was right, but something even worse happened. Fast forward to a few weeks later, I worked a shitty call center in Salt Lake City, third shift. It was my first night alone and I was feeling jumpy ever since the kiva. My brothers already warned me that I had a skinwalker following me, but of course didn't believe it. I don't smoke, but I followed my coworkers out for smoke breaks because I'm talkative and I like to chat. Tonight, I lurked in the doorway because I had this horrible cloud of dread hanging over me. I was peeping out the glass door and being a total weirdo. It hit me then how paranoid I had been. That's what skinwalkers do. They mess with your mind. While I was pacing on the front of the glass doors, I decided that this whole thing was stupid and I was going to go outside and stand there for the rest of my 10 minute break. 
Most of the smokers were already filling back in, but I walked out and put my hands in my pockets, looked at the sky, looked at the building, mentally patting myself on the back for not being a pussy. Then I saw something that I will never be able to give a rational or even halfway accountable explanation for. We have like six parking lots and one of the lots far away from me, maybe 100 feet, I could see something walking. It was a dog, obviously, but it was almost limping and walked like it was tired or hurt. Animal lover me forgot all about skinwalkers and I started walking toward it, making the come here doggy noises. And then I stopped abruptly. The dog had the body form of a greyhound and it was gray, but there was something very, very wrong with it. It had bloody legs and limped, but it walked more like a person would on feet and hands. Its butt was moving to and from, if that makes any sense. When it heard me, it just stopped without turning, something I've never known any dog to do. And finally, it looked over its shoulder at me. And this is the freaky part. This dog was looking at me the way a person does. It had huge eyes, way too big for a greyhound, and its teeth were bared like it was considering biting me. Then it growled, but it was like a whistle growl, noises no regular animals make. It almost sounded like it wanted to talk to me or was taunting me. Somehow, in the middle of all of this, I realized that it didn't have a tail, and I'd heard from all the Navajo stories that skinwalkers, when they appear as animals, don't have tails. Forgetting all logic and rationale, I turned and jetted. I didn't look back until I was back inside the building and had pulled the door shut behind me. And by then, when I looked, of course the thing was gone. When I described this to my brothers, they were absolutely sure it was a skinwalker. And they went through the trouble of blessing me, my apartment, them and their apartments. I never saw the creepy, bloody dog again and I have never even slightly wanted to visit the cliff ruins. Jacob cursed as he pushed through the thick underbrush trying to make his way to the tree stand he had built earlier in the summertime. He was certain that this location would give him an optimal line of sight to the neighboring field in which he frequently saw large herds of deer. This was going to be his year, and he was sure of it. This is the year that I bring home my trophy buck, he thought as he recalled the events of the day so far. He had awakened at 4.30 a.m. He began to prepare for a long day in the woods on the back side of his farm. His first order of business had been to locate and rescue his gloves and camouflaged hunting gear from whatever undisclosed location of his home that his wife had hidden them he would most assuredly need them this morning to protect him from the bitter cold November morning. How could it be this cold, this early in the year? He wondered as he started to work on his second task of the day, which was to prepare a breakfast that would stick to his ribs long into the day. He wasn't entirely sure what he wanted this morning, but he finally settled on toast ham and scrambled eggs that were just a little too runny. He topped it all off with a large cup of coffee that had left a bitter aftertaste on his tongue. In fact, he could still taste it. After accomplishing tasks one and two, he packed himself a bologna and cheese sandwich for lunch, grabbed his Remington 30 odd six hunting rifle, a thermos of coffee and headed out the door. 
He loaded his gear into his truck and pulled out of the driveway and turned right onto the one lane blacktop road that led to the backside of his property. After about two and a quarter miles, he turned right again off the blacktop onto a dirt road that was gouged with deep mud-filled ruts. He had traveled about half a mile down that pitiful rut-filled excuse for a road when he came to his desired location. He got out of his truck and loaded his gun and sauntered off into the wilderness. Jacob had gone a little more than 500 yards into the densely wooded tree line when he began to wish that he had put on an extra layer of clothing just to shield him against the chilly morning air. Ten minutes out of the truck and he was already cold, and it was made worse by the cloudy overcast day and the wind that was blowing steadily through the trees, making the autumn leaves rattle like dry bones. Oh well, he thought, it's going to be a good day anyway, especially if I bring home a big one. Jacob took about ten more steps when an uneasy feeling began to creep over him. He felt as though someone had stepped over his grave. He got the distinct feeling that he was being watched, but by whom? This was his property, and it was posted. No one had permission to be on his land. He had to be alone, but if he was alone, why couldn't he shake this eerie feeling that was scratching at the base of his skull? Something was off today. There was a deafening silence there in the forest. No birds or insects, only the sound in the wind and trees, convincing himself that it was nothing more than a case of nerves. He continued to press on until he came to a clearing not far from his tree stand. Stepping into the clearing, Jacob saw the remains of what appeared to be a large deer. He wasn't quite able to make out what he was seeing from the distance because the sun wasn't completely up yet, and the forest was still enveloped in shadows. Jacob walked closer to get a better look and found that he had been correct. It was a deer, a large eight-point buck in fact. Looking at the remains, he felt a sense of dread come over him, and icy fingers danced along his spine. Something about this kill just didn't seem right. The throat was completely torn out, and the stomach was ripped open. Plus, several of the internal organs were, well, missing. It was the most grisly thing he had ever seen. This definitely wasn't a coyote kill, and no hunter would have done this. They would have taken the head to have it mounted. What could have done this, he wondered. A fear like nothing he had ever experienced before began to wash over him in waves. What is going on, he thought. At nearly 225 pounds, and well over six foot, he wasn't one to give into fear. But now he couldn't seem to calm down, and his heart was beating like a trip hammer. The feeling that he was being watched was only getting stronger by the minute, and he could not shake the feeling that he was only moments away from a bad situation. He slowly started to back away from the mangled carcass, and head back to his truck, and back to safety. No more than six steps into his journey, his blood turned to ice in his veins, as a deep, guttural, wailing scream shattered the eerie silence and what was left of his courage. He had grown up on the farm all his life, and had been an experienced hunter since childhood. He was familiar with every animal in this part of the state. Not even a cougar, bobcat, or bear could have produced the scream that Tom had heard through the early morning forest and filled him with such a bone-chilling apprehension. 
primal fear now gave way to stark terror as he chambered around to his 30 odd six and turned around only to find there was nothing behind him. His mind raced with confusion, and he was confronted with a million thoughts at once. What should I do? What could it be? Should I run? Am I going to die? His survival sense kicking into overdrive. Jacob decided to continue on his previously contrived plan, which was to go to the truck, and get out of there while the getting was good. Slowly and cautiously, he made his way toward the perceived salvation of his vehicle, silently praying every step of the way. With 300 yards separating him from his only avenue of escape, Jacob began to hear heavy footfalls to his left. He could hear the crunching of withered leaves, sticks and debris that littered the forest floor, summoning every ounce of courage that remained within him. He forced himself to look in that direction, and that is when he saw the dark silhouette that followed him through the density of the tangled forest. Quickening his pace, he redoubled his efforts to reach the truck and to get a phone call out to the sheriff, the game warden, or anyone that would listen. He couldn't tell what it was that was stalking him, but he could clearly see that it towered more than seven feet and was incredibly massive. Jacob couldn't help but think he was about to become a national statistic, a person who left home under normal circumstances and just disappeared without a trace. How many people, he wondered, go into the woods and just vanish, and the authorities just assume that they have become lost or injured or have been the victims of an animal attack with their bodies never recovered. Please, God, don't let that happen to me, he thought, as he drew closer and closer to his truck. Seventy-five yards became fifty, and fifty became thirty. Thirty became ten. Like a miracle, he was back and opening his door. Throwing his rifle inside, he pulled himself up into the cab and started the engine and hit the gas. But the truck went nowhere. He had parked in a large mud puddle, and now the tires simply just spun, slinging mud thirty feet behind him. Oh no, not now, he thought. I can't be stuck, not now. Allowing himself a moment to think, Jacob quickly remembered this truck is a four-wheel drive. There is no way he could be stuck. Reaching down, he locked his truck in four-wheel drive and was prepared to punch the gas and leave this nightmare behind. Unfortunately for Jacob, some nightmares are not so easily left behind, and there is nothing worse than a nightmare you can't wake up from and Jacob was about to learn that he had the hard way. Hearing something to his right, he instinctively turned and immediately wished that he had not. It took him maybe a half a second to turn his head, but he would have given anything in the world to have that half second back because it was the last moment that his world would ever see normal again. In that split second, his world changed it was no longer a place where the world was light and safe, where he was just a husband and a father and a guy that liked to hunt and watch football on the weekends. That reality had evaporated away like early morning fog, and all that was left was a world where monsters existed and the things that really went bump in the night were right in his face. And now, an ambassador from that nightmare realm was standing just outside of his passenger door, a visible reminder that his world had been shaken and turned upside down. Jacob screamed as he stared transfixed on this escape from a horror movie. 
in his most terrifying, fever dream. He couldn't have imagined that such a thing could exist. It was hideously ugly, easily standing eight feet tall with a thick, muscular body. It looked very apish in appearance, but then again it didn't. There was just something about the face that was wrong, almost like an obscene amalgamation of a man and animal that had gone horribly awry. It was the most terrifying thing he had ever seen. It was completely covered with thick, shaggy black hair that was matted in areas with God only knows what. And it walked. It walked on two legs. Not four like you'd expect from animals. What was this thing that had shattered his perception of reality? Was it a demon? Or a werewolf? It can't be, he thought. Those things don't exist. Maybe it was some kind of reject from the island of Dr. Morrow. Whatever it was, it was staring at him, and it did not look happy. The menacing juggernaut threw its enormous head back and let out a blood-curdling scream that resonated throughout the surrounding area and seemed to vibrate him to his very core. Shocked back into action, Jacob threw his truck into gear and took off as though he were being chased by the very hounds of hell. Jacob, mind racing, wondering what he was going to do. How will I ever feel safe on this farm again, he thought. Are my wife and children in danger? Where did this thing come from? And will anyone believe me? The whirlwind of thoughts that swirled through Jacob's mind came to an immediate stop as he slammed on his brakes and nearly slid off the road. In a state of disbelief, Jacob sat staring at the large hackberry tree that laid across the dirt road and blocked his path, preventing him from reaching the blacktop and guaranteed safety. How is this even possible, he thought. I just came down this road not even 30 minutes ago, and this pathway was clear. However, this tree came to be across the road. It was painfully obvious to Jacob that he had to go get that tree moved if he was going to make it home. Since he had neither the chain to pull the tree out of the road, nor did he have a saw which he could cut through this unexpected barricade, he was left with only few viable options. One was walking, which he discounted almost immediately. The most logical course of action that he can come up with was to call for help. His best friend, Kenny Patterson, owned the farm just over from his. If he were home, he could bring a saw and cut the tree up for him. Jacob, with his nerves still frazzled and frayed, reached into his glove box and pulled out his cell phone and clumsily dialed Kenny's number. The phone rang six times and Jacob was about to give up when Kenny answered and said, Hey there, ugly. What do you want this early in the morning? As quickly as he could, he related the recent events to Kenny and said, Man, please hurry. I'm not kidding. There is something out here. Kenny, hearing the shakiness in his friend's voice, assured him that he would be there in just a matter of minutes. Jacob thanked him and hung up the phone, and braced himself for what he was sure to be the longest few minutes of his entire life. Sitting motionless with bated breath there in the truck, every sound made his imagination run wild with fear and expectance. Even though a little more than three minutes had passed since he had spoken to Kenny, it felt as if hours had passed. Each tick of the clock seemed to feel like an eternity. Jacob frequently checked in all directions for any sign that that nightmarish monstrosity had pursued him. In every shadow of that forest and this irritatingly cloudy day produced, he thought he saw the shape of the black beast that had followed him out of the woods. 
and he was afraid that he would lose his sanity long before Kenny arrived to clear out the tree out of his pathway. After what seemed like a lifetime, Jacob heard the sound of Kenny's old truck sputtering up the road, and in just moments he was able to see the old Chevrolet as it made its way closer to him. Jacob's spirits lifted when he saw his old friend, and a sense of relief washed over him as he realized he was no longer alone. Man, what took you so long? I asked you to hurry. Kenny, with an indignant look on his face, said, What are you talking about? You only called me 11 minutes ago. I think I made a pretty good time here. Jacob could hardly believe that only 11 minutes had passed. It seemed so much longer. After apologizing and telling him how exactly how happy he was to see him, both men walked over to the fallen tree and made a discovery that startled the both of them. The tree had not broken. It had not been cut. It had been pushed over and completely uprooted. All around the tree were large bipedal footprints that had somewhat a human appearance to them. But if they were human, the owner would require a size 28 shoe. Jacob and Kenny looked at each other and then without a word went to work on the tree. Kenny took a chainsaw from the bed of his truck and began to cut up the fallen blockade. Meanwhile, Jacob pulled the logs and debris from the road. Mission accomplished. Kenny put away his saw, and he and Jacob were about to get in their vehicles and leave. But before either man had even opened their doors, an ear-splitting scream that would have filled a banshee with paralyzing fear erupted from the woods behind them. Warily, Jacob walked over to Kenny and whispered, That's what I was telling you about. I don't know what that thing is, man, but it looks like some kind of monster, and I think we need to get out of here now. Kenny who looked as though the blood had drained completely out of his face and became very pale as he said to Jacob, Jacob, man, I've never mentioned this to anyone before, but over the last few months, that thing has been killing off a few of my cows. Their throats are usually torn out and the bodies are mangled and broken. I didn't want anyone to accuse me of being crazy and making stuff up, so I never said anything about it. But that's the reason I rushed over to you when you called. I've heard that sound a few times off in the distance at night, but never this close. So I think you're right, old buddy. It's time to go. Cautiously, and with a sense of urgency, Jacob and Kenny climbed into their vehicles and expeditiously made their way back to the blacktop. Turning left, both vehicles began the two and a half mile trek that led back to Jacob's house so they could decide what course of action should be taken. Jacob could feel the temperature drop as snow began to gently fall. He reached over and turned his wipers on as snow began to pelt the windshield harder. As he passed his neighbor, William Springer's farm, he noticed a herd of deer grazing in the field that bordered his own property. Having put a bit of distance between himself and the nightmare he had just encountered, Jacob felt a renewed sense of security as his fatigued nerves began to calm. Not willing to let this opportunity pass by him, Jacob turned on his hazard lights and pulled to the shoulder of the road and signaled Kenny to do the same. Kenny instinctively knew what Jacob was thinking as he pulled in behind him and turned his ignition off. Getting out of his truck, Kenny just said, What are you doing, man? We need to get out of here now. Jacob said, I know, I know, and we will in just a minute, man. I, I just can't turn this down. I have to take this shot. That is a six-point buck standing there. It's not the trophy I wanted, but at least I won't go home empty-handed, 
And after the morning I've had, we just, I don't know, I, I, I think we deserve a little something good. All right, just take the shot so we can go. I still don't feel right about this, Kenny said. Steadying his rifle across the hood of his truck, Jacob zeroed in on the buck and prepared to fire. That's when he heard Kenny make a gasping noise and whisper, <gasps> Oh my God. What is it, man? What's wrong with you? Raise your scope three inches, he said. Raising the scope, Jacob immediately saw what had been the cause of Kenny's alarm. Standing just outside the tree line in the edge of the field was the creature that they had left behind. Not even five minutes was this thing following them. Was it after the deer? What was it doing? Jacob watched the creature through his scope for a full 30 seconds before it ever moved. And when it did, it ignored him and the deer and started to lope off toward William's barn that was just about 500 yards from where the woodland demon had been standing. Jacob called out to Kenny and said, Kenny, call William and tell him there is something trying to get in his barn. I know he has at least two mares in there, and if that thing gets in it, it will kill all of them. An attempt to be rid of this monster, werewolf, sasquatch, wendigo, or whatever it was, Jacob fired a shot, but missed. The creature turned in their direction and glared at them through red, hate-filled eyes, and then began to run toward them at full steam. Kenny, who was still on the phone with William, screamed at Jacob to get in his truck and go. Jacob did as he was told, and Kenny followed suit. Starting their trucks, Jacob and Kenny both raced to Jacob's house, as though they were driving on the NASCAR circuit. Arriving home, gun in hand, both ran inside to get a phone book so that they can call the game warden and the police and get some kind of animal control out here to get rid of this thing. Jacob had just stepped out on his front porch when they heard gunfire coming over from William's place. Dropping the phone book and running back inside, Jacob grabbed his 12-gauge pump shotgun and some shells and handed them to Kenny, who took little time in loading it. Jacob and Kenny, now locked and loaded, walked together to Kenny's truck, preparing to mount up and rescue their neighbor, William. Simultaneously, both of them stopped in their tracks as an uneasy but familiar feeling crept over them and Jacob's Rottweiler and two German Shepherds began to whimper and ran under the front porch to hide. Kenny, whose throat was suddenly dry as a bone, whispered over to Jacob. Oh, I have a really bad feeling about this. No sooner had the words escaped his lips, they heard a deafening scream erupted from the forest off to their right and the creature exploded from the trees in front of them. Until now, neither man had been able to fully appreciate the colossal size and scope of the beast. But standing less than 30 feet away, they were almost overcome by the sheer magnitude of it. Jacob had seen it up close earlier from his truck while sitting down, and had guessed the height of maybe 8 feet. But now, standing there, looking up, he could tell that his fellow was eight and a half or maybe nine feet tall, and would easily tip the scale at roughly a thousand pounds. It had inhumanly long arms that bulged with thick, ropey muscle. They were easily seen beneath its long, shaggy black hair, which covered it from head to toe. The chest was rather large, larger than a 55-gallon drum, and there was little doubt that it could have pulled the arms off an ape, and now it glared at them with malevolent intent. Jacob and Kenny both opened fire without hesitation. 
the creature screamed with rage as the bullets tore into its massive body, knocking it to the ground, but not killing it or seriously injuring it. Jacob and Kenny watched speechless as it crawled into the tree line, struggling to its feet and limped away. Jacob ran back to the porch and grabbed the phone book and called the local game warden. Nearly two hours later, Gene, the local warden, showed up to take their statements and told them that he had been called out to answer numerous such reports in the area, but he wasn't sure what to make of all these reports. Guys, he said, I don't know what to tell you. There is no animal in this area, or any area for that matter, that fits your description. Now, I'm not saying I don't believe you. I'm just saying I don't know what it is. Jacob, whose face was reddened with anger, said, Come here. Here is the blood from when we shot it, and here are the footprints. A look of complete confusion washed over Jean's face, and he asked if they would care to go with him as he tried to track it. Jacob and Kenny agreed, but they said they weren't going without a gun. Jean stated that he had planned to take his gun as well. All three men loaded their guns and set out following the deeply impressed tracks and droplets of blood that had fallen on the withered leaves. They followed the trail for about a mile until arriving at a creek that was located deep in Jacob's woods, where the tracks that they were following were joined by others just like them. Some were smaller, but at least one set was larger. Deciding that the safest course of action would be to return home, they all went back to Jacob's. None of them relished the idea of staying out in the woods longer, since there was now apparently more than one and the cloudy overcast day made the forest seem even darker than it would normally be on this time of the day. Back at Jacob's, Jean informed them that there was nothing left he could do but file it under an unknown animal sighting, which made both Kenny and Jacob anything but happy. Jacob and Kenny spent the next couple of days trying to warn the neighbors to use caution when they were out in the forest. Most of their friends just laughed at them and said they had probably seen a bear or something. No one believed them except William, who had seen it himself the same day they had. He had even taken a shot at it, but missed. Jacob, William, and Kenny knew what they had seen, and they knew it was still out there, and they didn't care who believed them and who didn't. Over the next few more weeks, more and more neighbors began to take the story a little more seriously, as family pets began to disappear, and others were found brutally mangled. Other farms in the area began to find their cows and other livestock torn open with the throats ripped out. Just a week after shooting the creature in his yard, Jacob's own Rottweiler was found dead with its throat torn out hanging across a limb in a tree in his front yard. It almost seemed like a revenge killing. A few days later, one of William's new horses died the same way. The horse's mother had to be put to sleep because she had gone into shock over whatever she had witnessed there in the barn where her other horse was killed. Some people in the area still don't believe it. They think the whole story was made up but Jacob and Kenny know that there is still something out there in the forest. They still occasionally find tracks, or a slaughtered cow, or a goat. They still hear the blood-curdling screams off in the woods at night. They know that there is still something out there, watching and waiting, just biding its time. Something cold, calculated, cunning, and cruel. Something not human with a taste for blood and revenge.
When I was young, I was into anything unexplained, including Bigfoot, UFOs, Nessie, the Bermuda Triangle, etc. So I have always had an open mind about unexplained things. An odd connection to that interest was being raised in a Christian household. My father is a pastor and holds very deep and committed beliefs in what is written in the Bible. My brothers and I were taught from a very young age that things exist beyond our normal perception and that mainstream society would actively try to dismiss things such as miracles and healing or anything science could not explain. That belief also extended to spirits, demons, possession, and other things mentioned in the Old Testament. I mention this because the beliefs in anything Christian-based and cryptic are not often associated. However, even as a child, it made me open to the idea of things that mainstream society doesn't believe in can exist, and that it might be in modern science's best interest to dismiss the idea of such things since they cannot be explained by any current knowledge. The reason for this would be that modern science has be seen as having all the answers and cannot be questioned. I was also instilled with a distrust of authority as an entity and consensus as a barometer of truth and was encouraged to look for the truth myself. We were taught to keep an eye out for when lies might be more convenient than facts. That fostered a constant sense of existence of truth outside the textbook and in an awareness of suppression of thought, but also helped keep my mind open to all kinds of things, spiritual and otherwise. We did not, however, believe in Santa, the Tooth Fairy, the Easter Bunny, or other cartoonish things, even within our realm of belief. There were firm limits. Some may associate any belief in God as the same as belief in Santa. However, this seemed to foster in me an openness to the unknown without believing for the sake of novelty and focus towards what evidence does exist. People don't write books and have conferences about the existence of Santa, as far as I know. By the time this happened to me, I was well open to the idea of UFOs and believed in the existence of Bigfoot. However, I never believed I would ever see one. In fact, I'm not even sure I wanted to at the time, or now. In my teenage years, I was busy with sports, music, and girls, and I had put my interest in the unknown in the back of my head. Until one weekend in 1995 or 96. I am recalling this as best as my memory serves. I lived in very rural southwest Colorado at the time, in a town small enough that I could walk out my back door with a fishing pole and a rifle, and hike around and nobody would say a word. I won't mention the name because the town is small enough someone could probably find out who I am just by knowing where that I live there. The area itself has tons of deer and elk in town, and sometimes had issues with mountain lions that would move into town and take livestock and other small pets. A little further outside of town, we would see bears, and there are large areas of unoccupied forest nearby. I mention this to establish that, while I live and have lived in big cities for a good chunk of my life, I also have spent plenty of time in the rural areas and wilderness, hunting, fishing, and camping. I have an uncle that lives in Denver. And at the time, he and his then wife had bought a cabin outside of Fairplay 
which is where the old town of South Park City is. The area is called South Park, as a park is a flat area or valley of high elevation in a mountain range. In order to get there from Denver, you drive through places like Breckenridge, the ski resort town, to give you an idea of what the terrain was like. There are large swatches of national forest connecting around mountain peaks and areas where people either cannot access or rarely set foot. The cabins in the areas were really just modern houses built out in the woods with a bit of rustic but modern amenities. There were other houses within eyesight of his cabin and the town was not too far away. So the area was sparse, but not completely isolated by any means. There were large fields of open ground, but the houses were built very close to thick forests that go up to the nearby mountains. One would simply have to cross a two-track dirt road, and you would be in a forest where you could walk in a straight line for miles without seeing any sign of a human. This cabin had a large wood patio around the back and down one side, large glass windows in the living room facing the forest. The downstairs bathroom, the one we would primarily use, had semi-obscured glass blocks as a wall that faced the forest as well. There were motion sensor lights around the house and other modern amenities. The house was two-story with one of the upstairs rooms having windows that faced a thicket of pine and aspen trees that was actually about 10 to 15 feet high as the ground sloped away from the house on that side. I was 16 or 17 at the time and still in high school. Over the 4th of July weekend, my uncle invited some family and friends up to the cabin, just for a few days. We arrived right at dusk, a few days before the 4th. It was my mom and dad, my younger brother, two cousins, and two aunts and uncles, all sharing the house for the holiday. As soon as I got out of the car, I felt a massive uneasiness come down on me like a blanket. I honestly felt scared or in danger like I had suddenly stepped into a bad neighborhood. While I was trying to process this feeling and how out of place it was in the woods, I noticed my little brother seemed a bit jittery too, so I asked if he could feel that. He said he did. When I asked him what he thought it was, he whispered, Bigfoot, as if the word came out of him before the thought was actually in his head. Hearing him say what I was thinking made me shudder, and my hair raised on the back of my neck. We got the luggage in the house as fast as we could, with me looking over my shoulder at the tree line the whole time, but also trying to act normal. The adults were busy greeting each other and did not act like anything was wrong. However, I felt like I needed to at least reach the light of the porch as soon as possible, or something bad was going to happen. That night, everything was uneventful, with the parents talking late and us kids all in sleeping bags open on the living room floor. I'm pretty sure I fell asleep while the adults were still up, and being inside with them around felt safe. But I still felt very afraid about what might be outside the house. The next morning we got up, ate, and did the typical family gathering bathroom rotation. Some of the adults went on a hike. The weather was beautiful. The sky was clear and all the sense of unease was gone completely. The area was simply gorgeous. My brother and I talked a little bit about what we had said the night before 
and I think we both felt a bit foolish about being so afraid. Since there was nothing else to do, we set up about exploring around the area with the loose goal of finding some kind of Bigfoot evidence. My cousin was primarily a big city kid, but when we told him what we were about, he was in too. In the back of my head, I had remembered some signs to look for, whether from a book or one of the few TV specials that were put out at the time. This was a time before anyone had talked about tree knocks or howling, so we stuck to looking for large animal signs. We found some odd things that morning. I spotted where leaves and bark were worn off the trees, about six to eight feet up. We found some small structures and oddly placed sticks in earth, and also some saplings that had been all twisted up. Probably the most significant thing we had found was a mature aspen on its side that had been completely uprooted in the middle of a grove of other unharmed trees. There were no signs of digging or other tools, and no rot of the tree itself. Even at my young age, I could conclude that it could not have been wind or some kind of mechanical force that would have caused this without there being any damage to the rest of the trees. Their shape was too tight to allow a backhoe or truck through without scraping up the other trees. That summer had been dry, so there were no footprints or other clear signs, however. There was certainly nothing I could show an adult without sounding a little nutty, so we kept our investigation to ourselves. Most of the things we found were relatively close to the house. I'm not sure the age of the neighborhood but I knew the houses hadn't been there very long, and the area was slowly being developed, but was still very close to large areas of uninhabited forest. Late that morning, I took a nap outside in a hammock. The breeze was perfect. There were wildflowers blooming. It was peaceful and quiet, with the exception of one of the neighboring cabin's dogs. I could hear once in a while. We ate hot dogs, threw a football, and had a great, typical summer day. After a while, I forgot what I had felt the night before. That lasted until the early afternoon, just as the sun started to get close to the mountains on the horizon. Almost like a moving fog, the sense of unease and dread came back as strong as I felt the night before. I fought with myself a bit, trying to shake the feeling off, and telling myself I was being irrational and weak, but I couldn't rid myself of the feeling and did not feel relief until I was back in the house. I was flat out afraid of what was out there, and it felt like it was not only aware, but interested in us. We spent the rest of the afternoon playing music upstairs, as my cousin and I played guitar and bass together and had brought our instruments. We even wrote a goofy, childish song that I could still remember and can play to this day. The guitar riff isn't bad, but I've grown out of the lyrics comparing the past to dirty underwear, ha <laughs> ha. Looking back, it's still strange the way things felt. Inside the house were surrounded by adults and light and laughter, so I would forget what I was feeling. Then I'd be alone for a minute or step outside to get something from the car and be reminded again immediately. I know I did a good job hiding it because years later, when I told the people that were there what we saw, nobody had any idea we were afraid at all. That evening, we drove into town and rented a movie, Vertigo, if I recall correctly, and ate dinner as a group. Some of the food prep was going on outside on the grill, but I don't know how to tell my dad or uncles that I was afraid for them and that they seemed to notice nothing at all. After dinner, 
Some wine and beers were out along with dessert, and we put on a little concert for the adults, including the debut of our underwear song. Things were fine until the adults all trickled off into their rooms, and I was left with my brother and cousin in the living room, with its large windows and very thin curtains. I was having a hard time sleeping, though my brother and cousin didn't. My brother could fall asleep anywhere and sleep through anything. Sometime in the middle of the dead calm night, the motion sensor lights came on with a barely audible click. There was no sound, no wind, and even the neighbor's dog, which had been loud all day, was dead silent. After a few intense minutes, they turned off, then came on again, and again. I did not dare peek out the windows, but I could picture a giant hairy creature walking on two legs around the porch, trying to look in. With only a thin piece of glass and a white sheet of fabric separating us, I pretty much did not sleep that night. I was about six foot and 165 pounds, almost a full grown adult. Yet here I was in a secure house with six adults under the same roof, but as scared as a baby, wishing one of them was in the room with me. The fear was almost paralyzing. I wouldn't even use the bathroom because I was worried I would see something through the decorative glass blocks that I could not unsee. The next morning was the fourth, and everything felt fine again, but I knew that would not last. We poked around outside some more, but I really did not want to stray too far from the house now. We saw a few more things, but nothing significant. The day was very cloudy and cold, with the heat and threat of a heavy thunderstorm that might hit any time typical unpredictable summer mountain weather. That afternoon, some people showed up for a party, but rain came very heavy off and on and prevented any fireworks. However, there were strange things happening around the house. A few of the visitors brought their dogs and my uncle and his wife's two dogs, who happened to live harmoniously together for quite a long time had a severe fight out of nowhere. My uncle had to hit his dog over the head with a shovel just to get her to go let go of the other dog. It was a sort of traumatic event that I never experienced since we didn't have dogs growing up, with people crying and yelling. I heard someone say there was dominance issues between the two dogs just due to the presence of another but I felt there was another tension in the air they could sense that was causing them to act strange. They never once fought before. Around the time when the dogs had their altercation, the feeling returned so heavily I was about to crawl out of my skin. So I asked my brother and cousin if they wanted to go hang out inside the cabin. With the threat of the storm and the dogs fighting, everything felt off and tense, like something dark was pressing down on me. This time it felt more acute, while before it had only been more of a vague sense. I felt like something was close by. We borrowed some binoculars and decided to go to the room upstairs just to see what we could see in the forest from the window. I felt a little more secure up high and out of reach. I tried to pinpoint a direction from where the feeling was coming from and focus the binoculars on that area in the trees. I was zoomed in, moving the binoculars around and trying to focus on anything odd that I could see. I began to focus the lens on one aspen when I noticed I was seeing a dark shape behind it. All at once, my eyes and brain reconciled what I was focusing on. Matted fur, with sticks and leaves stuck to it, the shape of a shoulder. And then it moved. 
I almost dropped the binoculars, and my heart was beating out of my chest as I shuddered. I just saw a Bigfoot! I began shaking and had never felt so much fear in my life. My head was spinning, still trying to figure out what I knew I had seen. My brother and cousin both took a turn looking through the binoculars immediately after me, as I wouldn't even put them back up to my eyes again. At first, they both acted like I was playing a prank, but both of them soon were as white as I was. My cousin said he was looking directly into a face with a skin texture similar to a gorilla. He said it was almost as if it, they made eye contact through the binoculars, and the eyes were empty and emotionless, and that made him more afraid. My brother said he saw a side profile as the creature had turned to look out into the clearing. He also described a gorilla-like profile, but he had no doubt what it was, and he also had no doubt he was interested in us. We actually shut the blinds and did not go downstairs for some time until we could act normal again. It still amazes me in the situation that I saw what I believed could have been proof of the existence of Bigfoot. It was within a hundred yards of the house, yet I didn't do anything to get concrete evidence. I could have told my uncle or dad or asked to borrow a camera because my uncle is a photographer. But the fear was just so overwhelming, I couldn't even think of looking at it again much less venturing into the woods after it. In the moment, processing the information almost makes it feel like your mind is splitting because your eyes are seeing something and communicating that something back to the brain. But the brain is telling the eyes to look again because that doesn't fit with what the brain knows should or should not exist. I partially think some of the fear was just fear of the unknown. I don't have any idea if the creature would have snatched one of us or even done anything at all besides observe us, but I somehow knew it was aware that we knew it was there. We also knew that it knew it could destroy us if it chose to. We all left the cabin the next morning and I remember feeling a great sense of relief leaving the area. It was years before I talked to any adults on the trip about what we saw. I told my dad about it late at night on another road trip across Colorado. He didn't say whether he believed me or not, but he said he felt there was so much wilderness in the US that it was conceivable to him that a North American ape could exist, yet elude mankind. My uncle, who I told years later, said he wished I'd told him so he could have started looking because he hiked and fished around there all the time. He said he felt he missed out on not being aware that something might have been in the area. They sold the cabin years ago, but in the last few years there have been many sightings in the area. There were prints casted about a mile or two from the cabin near a four mile creek on the back side of Pikes Peak. So sightings are frequent in the area, and we are not the only ones to have seen something nearby. Now that the internet has made it available for more people to communicate their personal stories, I feel much more confident telling my story. The behavior patterns seem to fit, with the creature being interested in the only kids at the house, and not seeming to pay any attention to the adults. I'm not sure why none of the adults could feel it, but I still get hairs on the back of my neck standing up just thinking about it. I never felt the fear that potent, yet I didn't necessarily feel threatened directly, just scared of something huge that was aware of me and could have kidnapped me if it wanted to. I also attributed the uneasiness that I didn't feel in the morning but coming on into the afternoon to the sleep pattern of that particular Bigfoot, and it possibly watching us out of curiosity in the afternoon, and even into the evening. I have been in the woods plenty of times since, but I am still haunted by what I saw, 
and have to make a serious effort to not think about it when I am out, or else the fear can still paralyze me all these years later. Somehow, knowing it exists, yet so many people not believing it, generates even more fear. From a certain perspective, ignorance can be bliss. On the other hand, I like living in a world where mysteries still exist, and science is not as settled as they portray. Months later, I can remember all of them, down to the slightest idiosyncrasies and quirks. They were my friends, and they're gone now. There's a hole in my life where they were. Sometimes I'll remember something they said or did, and it'll just hit me like a ton of bricks. They're gone now, and I'm only left with memories of them. I'm sorry for being mundane and bringing everyone else down, but I think this is the only way I could really introduce my story and explain why I feel like I have to type this out. I think that writing this is the only way I can learn to accept that. I'll try and keep these downer tendencies to myself as I'm writing all of this down, but I can't make any promises. I know that being the third wheel in a group can be a terrible thing, but I can think of something worse. Being the fifth wheel. If you're the third wheel, that makes your group a semi-functional tricycle. If you're the fifth wheel, you're left as some obscure car from the 50s that no one remembers or even cares about. Imagine not being able to follow the in-jokes and shared history of one couple and multiply that by two. Getting stuck as the fifth wheel is twice as bad. That was the frame of mind I had as we all paid into Ian's car to go into the national forest for our hike. I know that's a weird opening to give all of this after my depressing opening, but I want you all to have an idea of my mindset. I'm not quite sure how to describe all of this but I do know that I need to tell someone. I need someone else to know what happened and help me come to terms with it all. I think the only way I'll be able to explain this is to help you see from my perspective as much as possible. So there we were, driving down to Gila for a hike, with me feeling like the fifth wheel wedged between two of Ian's friends who I don't even know. Three of us were crammed in the back seat while Ian and his girlfriend were up front. I look back at that unnecessary bit of moping back in August of 2016 as one of the last few moments of normalcy I would have in my life. I tried to make the best of the situation. I really did. Ian was always more social of us. Our mom used to tell us that Ian can make anyone his friend, and that once I had a friend that I kept them. It was one of those parental platitudes that was given to us to reassure a socially awkward child that there was nothing wrong. Unfortunately, it would have taken me almost 19 years to learn that that wasn't true. Instead of taking my therapist's diagnosis of social anxiety disorder, Following a breakdown after an office get-together as a means for seeking treatment, I used it as an excuse to cloister myself up from the world. I stayed in my apartment when I wasn't working and told myself that I was just doing what was best for me. Of course, Ian decided that that wasn't healthy and convinced me to go on a weekend-long hike with him. It wasn't until I showed up at his house at 6 in the morning on Friday 
after taking the day off work that I saw that he had invited others along. I think he saw it as a means of me getting help and breaking me out of my shell. Unfortunately though, with Ian's extroverted nature, he didn't even realize that I like being in my shell. It was comfortable. A turtle doesn't like being broken out of its shell. After a brief introduction where I caught no one's name except for those I already knew, my brothers and his girlfriend Jessica, due to morning grogginess and the rushed introduction, we packed up the car and left for our hike. It took three hours of mostly awkward silence for us to reach our destination. Ian tried to make conversation, but my short responses and the other's sleepiness killed him off fairly quickly. We had found the parking lot near the Gila Cliff dwellings. As we unpacked our gear, we took a moment to bask in the beautiful sight that sat perched above us. It's hard to believe that someone could carve an entire town into the face of a cliff. But 700 years ago, people managed to do just that. Given that the parking lot was empty, except for us, we would find out why later, and I was in need of some social lubrication. We split a six pack of beer and took in the majesty. Here's a picture in case you were wondering what the area looked like. As we finished our beers, got everything prepared and used the restrooms, Ian explained what path we would be taking in detail. What we didn't know and what my brother had failed to tell us was that the West Fork Trail had been closed all that summer due to flooding. To be honest, the path wasn't that dangerous. They had just opted not to clear it due to the recent flooding, so it would be a bit more of a rugged hike. While it wasn't perilous in itself, it did keep us from encountering other hikers which would cause a lot of problems when we actually needed help. Ian figured that we could make about two to three miles per hour and we would be able to complete the Gila Loop, which was about 30 miles long with enough time to get back on Sunday and be ready for our respective jobs on Monday, with no one any the wiser than we had backpacked a closed section of the National Park. As his explanation was a bit heavy on names and locations, some of which I can't recall clearly. I'll opt to include a picture rather than spend a page writing on everything. For the sake of simplicity, this is the path we were planning to take. I'll include more detailed map in the area below. In addition, I'll include a more detailed map of the entire area so you can orient yourself if you want to trace the trail that we took. If you plan on following along with the path as I tell you about this experience, all I can say is good luck. Even as I stare at it now, I feel just as lost now as I was then. I was just going along with the group and trying to keep a positive mind about everything. I wanted to try and do a better job of getting to know Ian and Jessica's friends. I think my circumstances had finally begun to set in. I had been living in a quiet apartment in New Mexico for over a year and I had no friends. I would go to work and then home without doing anything else. Sometimes I would spend the entire weekend without saying a single word to anyone or seeing another person. I knew that if I didn't change something quick, that solitude would become the norm, and that frightened me. Our first day was relatively quiet. We spent a majority of the time taking in the sights, soaking in the sun, and breathing the fresh air. The hike felt like we were constantly moving upward. As I was unaccustomed to hiking, I frequently fell behind, but I never completely lost sight of my brother's friends. While we took a break under the shade of a tree, whose bark looked like dried scales from some long, dead alligator, I tried to make small talk with everyone. 
I fell into a quick conversation with Ian and Jessica about their work and what they had been up to lately. When it came time to talk to the other two, I only managed to get the conversation going for a few sentences before it shriveled up and died. I remembered assuring myself that it would be easier when we stopped for the night. We rested while before continuing our ascent up the mesa. This was where everyone realized how truly out of my element I was here. The path up the mesa was agonizing for me. It seemed to never stop climbing up, and there was almost no shade to keep the sun from beating down on us. I was sweating buckets, panting, and wheezing whenever they stopped to wait for me to catch up. I tried to pretend that I didn't notice their exasperated whispers or side glances, but it was easier said than done. They seemed like the outdoorsy type that had been doing this sort of thing for years. By the time our path started to level out, I was ready to turn around and leave. It wasn't until we reached the top and looked out over everything that I realized how foolish of an idea that was. Even if I was able to convince Ian to give me the keys and let me walk back to the car and go home, I had no idea where I was going or what trail markers we had even been using. I imagined splitting off from the group and tromping through Poison Ivy, bumbling into a rapey gang of banjo-playing hill folk, or getting lost in the dark and wandering in circles until exhaustion and exposure took me. Even if I did manage to hike back to the parking lot, where was I going to go? Would I go back home to my empty apartment, eat a Hot Pocket and feel sorry for myself again? I decided to tough it out and continue hiking. We made camp at a dry section of the Indian Creek after having hiked a decent amount. Ian was confident that we would make it back on Sunday and that the next few days were going to be less intensive. We ate some food and stowed the rest in a bear bag a ways away from the camp. We were passing a bottle of whiskey around in front of the campfire we had built when the conversation shifted to the most awkward moments everyone had experienced. Ian retold his story about the first time he met Jessica at a club where he was way too drunk for his own good and ended up puking into her purse. She bristled at the memory and jokingly called Ian an asshole for that. Each person shared their stories about a bumbling first kiss where their braces got hooked together, locking themselves out of their dorm rooms in their underwear, their cringe-inducing high school edgelord personality, and caring for their drunken boyfriend who puked into their favorite bag. Then the bottle came to me, and it was my turn to tell them a story. I instantly knew what my most embarrassing story was the moment we started the conversation. I didn't tell them about the door though. Instead, I made up a story ripping my pants in front of a group of people during a work interview that I had probably ripped straight from a 90s sitcom. They laughed with me and I felt like a piece of shit. They had bothered to reveal their most embarrassing moments and were commiserating in their shared experience and here I was, too afraid to tell them the truth to tell them about the door. The conversation continued for a bit afterwards as we killed the bottle. When it was dead, we all went to bed still pretty drunk after dousing the campfire. I woke up in the middle of the night, desperately needing to use the bathroom, still a bit fuzzy from the whiskey. I tromped out to the woods to do my business. It wasn't until I was almost done that Nadia's voice cut through the blackness. She asked me if I had a lighter. Since I hadn't heard her approach, the sound of her voice made me jump. It would have scared the piss out of me had I not just gone to the bathroom. I mumbled something about her having a lighter back around the camp. She told me that she had dropped hers and asked me to help her look for it. 
but I was too out of it to be any good to anyone, so I told her that we'd have to look for it later. I vaguely remember her mumbling a protest as I stumbled back to my sleeping roll. It wasn't until I woke up the next morning that I realized how stupid I had been. Apparently, they had heard howling in the surrounding woods all last night. They thought that the sound could have possibly belonged to the Mexican Grey Wolf, but no one was sure. Ian knew that they inhabited the area, but were quite uncommon. I paled at the thought of being mauled by a wolf while out peeing in the middle of the woods. I decided next time I would wake up Ian before going out to the woods to answer the call of nature. We packed up a while later after a light breakfast and continued on our hike. The second day was a little better. The overbearing sun I suffered under previously was hidden behind heavy clouds. We crossed a number of rivers as we followed the 157 to 729 junction. We went along Little Bear Canyon as we headed towards the TJ Coral which was towards the end of the hiking loop. As the path hadn't been cleared yet, we frequently had to dodge patches of poison ivy and stinging nettles. I fared much better on this hike and despite nursing a slight hangover, I felt like I was doing a much better job of getting around with my pack and clunky boots my brother had loaned me. We made camp around midday and purified some water from a nearby river, boiling water and adding iodine tablets to them, as the last section of our hike didn't really have many opportunities for drinkable water. I think that maybe our encounter last night with the yipping and the howling wolves have added to a bit of seriousness to the hike as there wasn't as much joking around or conversations this night. We did talk a little bit, but mainly just as something small to eat while we stared into the campfire. Ian and Jessica were the first to call it for the night. I stayed up with the others for a bit, but we were mainly silent. The other two slowly went off after a bit and I decided to enjoy the warmth a bit longer before getting ready to go to bed for the night. Just as I finished dousing the fire, I remember Gary coming up to me and asking for the map. He told me he wanted to plan out the rest of our trip and that there was a spring nearby that we should really visit that wasn't too far out of the way. I grabbed the map from Ian's pack and gave it to him before turning in. I woke up the next morning to the sound of Ian rustling around his bag. He sounded angrier the longer he searched. He knocked mess kits into each other as he peered deep into the pack for something he was missing. Frustrated that he wasn't finding the item he was looking for, he turned the bag upside down and dumped out everything. He was practically ready to tear out his own hair and it seemed like he had spent the entire morning looking for that one thing. Wanting to know what was up, I walked up to him and we started talking. He asked me, Hey man, have you seen the map anywhere? I can't seem to find it. Where's Gary? I gave him the map last night so he could map out a little detour on the trip so we could visit a spring. Why don't you ask him? He probably knows. I answered. It was then that Ian said something that changed everything. Gary, who are you talking about? Do you mean Oliver? Don't tell me you thought his name was… I explained. No, I'm talking about Gary. Tall guy, kinda lanky. You're joking, right? He looked confused for a few seconds and made a questioning sound like a really old computer trying to process something moments before it catches on fire. The pieces clicked and Ian shouted, Who the fuck is Gary? Getting the attention of everyone in the area. 
he was some fucking guy asked you for our map in the middle of the night and you just fucking gave it to him you handed our stuff to some random stranger you met in the woods I tried to explain myself and tell him that I knew Gary and that he did too since I remember hiking with him the day before but I couldn't find the words to convey that point it was here that Jessica stepped in and asked what was going on. Ian vented. How fucking stupid are you, Evan? Some random guy named Gary comes up to you in the middle of the night asking for our shit and you just give it to him? Christ, we needed that map to get around smoothly since the trails out here haven't been cleared. Ian shouted for about 15 minutes while everyone became aware of our situation. Jessica managed to calm him down enough so we could figure out our next move. While we weren't completely screwed, as Ian had mesmerized a large portion of the trail markers, it was going to be a lot harder to navigate the necessary junctions to bring us back around to our car. We packed up all of our stuff, making sure that the guy hadn't taken anything else, and we left. The entire hike, I could feel Ian's eyes drilling into me. The last time I had seen him this furious was just before he got into a fight with Aaron Fredlinger and beat him to a pulp. He got suspended for a week, and Aaron got a black eye, busted lip, and never said anything about our mom again. Each time we came across a break in the path, we spent a few minutes while Ian tried to remember where to go. The fact that the trails had been closed and the paths were overgrown only served to make everything more difficult. I think that's how we made a wrong turn and began wandering on the faint trail. I don't actually know if that's where it went wrong since we didn't have the map at that time, but that's my best guess. Further away from home and safety. Towards midday, tensions had reached a critical point. Ian frequently mumbled things that would make a sailor blush, while Jessica tried to hide the fact that she was close to crying. Oliver attempted to lighten the situation by telling everyone that we just had to follow the compass and we would get home, safe and sound. Oliver's girlfriend didn't say much. She just stared quietly at her feet as she walked. I think she had the right idea since Lucas was constantly misplacing his footing and slipping. He looked like he had downed a fifth of vodka and was now trying to walk home on a tightrope while being randomly shocked with a cattle prod. The realization twisted something deep down inside and made me want to vomit. I stopped walking and began talking to Lucas. What's going on with you, man? Ian, still pissed off at me, took this opportunity to vent a bit. Huh? What are you talking about now? Lucas is bumbling and twitching all over the place. What's wrong with- Don't be a dick, man. You know he has multiple sclerosis. We told you before the hike started about his condition. As soon as he said it, the events came rushing back to me, clear as day. I recalled Ian pulling me to the side and telling me about his friend's diagnosis and how this was likely going to be his last opportunity to undertake a long hike like this. So we had to help him move, and slowly. I remembered watching him scramble up the trail and thinking about our own mom and her illness. It brought back bittersweet memories of birthday wishes given to us from hospital beds and hearing her sob quietly to herself in the middle of the night when she thought we were asleep. Guilt flooded over me and I stepped forward to apologize to Lucas when it happened. Lucas growled at me the instant I took a step forward and he dropped to a hunched position on his hands and feet. It almost looked like his skin was bristling at a possible threat and I could see his broken and decaying teeth as he hissed at all of us before taking off at a hopping stride into the woods. He moved like one of those CGI monstrosities 
from the last Planet of the Ape movie, his shaky and unstable balance was replaced by a more natural and animalistic gait as he loped into the distance and disappeared amongst the trees. The last thing I saw was what I assumed were its clothes, sloughing off of its body, revealing that they weren't actually clothes, but gray folds of skin. Oliver was the first to talk. What the fuck? As soon as Oliver said those words, it was like a switch had flipped that set everyone to panic mode. We began to run along the trail as if it would do us any good. The only thought in my head was to put as much distance as possible between me and that thing. I think it took a good 15 minutes for us to run out of energy with our heavy packs and the disorienting nature of the woods. As we tried to catch our breath, I surveyed the area around us and came to a terrible realization. In our panic, we had run off the path and were now even deeper in the woods. We tried to make sense of what we saw. I just remember Ian mumbling the same phrase over and over. What the hell was that? The short answer is that it was Lucas. The long of it is this. There was no Lucas. Not really. I'm sorry for interrupting the story in the middle like this, but I think now is the best time to try and explain everything. I know how confusing this all seems with Gary and Lucas. The truth is, I did that because I don't think I could have appropriately explained to you without you first experiencing it from my eyes. I don't know what to call those things, but they do something to your mind. They insinuate themselves into your memories. They wrap themselves up in a wall of your reflections, and even though you know something is wrong, you can't quite put your finger on it. Your group of four friends could grow to five, and you wouldn't be any the wiser. A part of you will stupidly admonish you forever. You look at it, and you recognize the face. You remember events. You remember getting drunk at a bar together. You remember them crying on your shoulder after a rough breakup. You remember everything that happened between you, but none of it's true. I don't know how it does it. It crawls into your head and somehow makes you see things in a way that benefits them. It can mold memories, but it can't mimic human movement. It walks on four claws not two feet. It growls, hisses, and snarls. It does not talk. It infiltrates, observes, and waits. It was hunting us, trying to drive us deeper into the wilderness. It was succeeding. We never really reached much of a conclusion about what the thing was, but we did reach a consensus that we had to get out of there as soon as possible. I watched Ian as he looked around at the forest and came to the same realization that I did. We were lost. He didn't tell the others. I think he realized that panicking would only get us in more trouble. Instead, he told us to follow him. With the shock of our encounter setting in, we could do nothing but follow his lead and hope it all worked out. As we walked, we could hear the sounds of distant animals howling and calling out to each other. The terror of our situation deepened as the others whispered that those were the same noises they had heard the first night out in the woods. Whatever this thing was, it was following us and calling out to other things in the area. At the time, I couldn't stop thinking about one of them barreling out from the underbrush and sinking its black and rotting teeth into my neck before the rest of the group could react. I remember brushing the thought off and mentally reassuring myself that there was six of us here and we had only actually encountered one of the creatures. 
As the day pressed on, we seemingly wandered the south in an attempt to pick up another trail that would lead us back to the parking lot. I couldn't help but shake a nagging feeling in the back of my mind. It felt like I had forgotten some important deadline that I should have never forgotten about. It wasn't until Oliver mentioned that his wish of being back in the car that Jessica stopped dead in her tracks. We all turned towards her, but knew what was coming the second she asked. We only took one car down, right? Ian snapped, more fearful than frustrated. Of course we did. Remember how cramped everyone was in that tiny ass Prius with all of our camping gear smashed in the trunk and on our laps? What about it? Jessica went white as if this was the first time that Ian had ever raised his voice to her. She paused for a moment before asking, How many of us are here right now, and how many did your car seat? Ian's car sat four people comfortably, five uncomfortably, and there were six of us out in the woods that moment. Everything happened at once. Ian swore. Oliver's girlfriend gave a half shriek and a half gasp while I looked wide-eyed from person to person, trying to figure out which one of us didn't belong there. Sarah was the only one who managed to say something that was... She hadn't finished her words before her jaw popped open. I don't mean that it dropped open like she was astonished at something. It popped open like it had dislocated from her face. The space between her lips was a massive, sickly pink void of inflamed gums that was at least a foot wide. She looked at us with dead and dull eyes as she slowly raised a twitching hand up to her jaw and tried to lock it back into a more human-esque appearance. Finally, she popped it back into place with a hollow-sounding squelch of meat and bone, shifting as if nothing was wrong about what had just happened before. She tried to speak again. It's me. Ian was the first to react. He stepped towards this failed copy of a human and swung his walking stick at her face while bellowing, Get out of here! She hopped back from the attack in a sloppy motion and landed on all fours. Her body shuddered as if an electrical jolt had passed through her as she slowly backed away from all of us while facing Jessica the entire time. She hissed at one of us one last time before retreating deeper into the woods with a convulsing loop. It took a moment for all of us to regain our composure before we continued walking while trying to look in every direction at once. I remember Oliver rambling as we walked. He kept asking, although no one was responding to him. Did you see how it moved? It was twitching like an epileptic and a rave. You ever seen one of those documentaries about mad cow disease? That thing was twitching and moving like one of those infected cows. What the hell was that thing? Was it a person? What kind of person can do that to their body? It tried to talk to us. It... He rambled for hours before we had to stop. We had to tell him to shut up because we were worried about that thing hearing us. Though, that really wasn't the case. We made him stop talking because it only served to scare us. Despite stopping for the night, none of us actually slept. We sat around a campfire and listened to the sound of a high-pitched whining and yelping coming from all around us. It seemed like any time I actually got close to falling asleep, the calls would start up and jolt me awake. We spoke in hushed whispers and tried to figure out what they wanted with us even though none of us really wanted the answer to that question. The hours dragged on almost endlessly before dawn broke, and we continued our hike. 
We spent Sunday hiking around trying to find a familiar site, without any real sense of where we were and where we were going. Our only hope was to stumble across another hiker or find an area with a high enough vantage point that we could survey the entire area. Unfortunately, any elevations we climbed didn't afford a good view of the area and it was extremely unlikely that we would find another hiker due to the fact that the trail had been closed and wasn't cleared. Even if we did, what are the chances that we would trust them and could be certain that it wasn't one of those things? I hope you enjoyed part one of Fleshgate. Stay tuned for part two to the conclusion of the story. Stay alert, lock your windows, and keep a lookout. You never know what's lurking in the night. Welcome back to part two. Enjoy your stay. <laughs> Midway through the day, Ian whispered to me, Count the people wearing backpacks. One of them is with us again. I casually looked over my shoulder and noticed that one of our group was walking without any gear. They trailed behind us, but were still in our vicinity. They moved slowly but didn't show any of the jerky movements of the previous two. The thought that it was learning to mimic our movements unsettled me. Without really thinking, I shucked off my backpack and approached the imposter. Before they knew what was happening, I shoved them as hard as I could. The instant my hands pressed into their shirt, I felt something slick and warm give way like the outer layer falling off of a rotten mango. Their shirt slid off their body into my hands, and I quickly realized it was their skin. The thing was actually naked, but gave the appearance of clothes by altering the color of its almost translucent skin. I dropped the skin that had sloughed off and it hit the ground with a wet slap. The creature toppled backwards and began yelping. I can only describe the sound like this. Imagine getting out of your bed in the middle of the night to go and take a piss. As you are feeling your way through the darkness to get out of the room, you step on your dog's tail. Imagine that surprised yelp of pain and the surprise that comes along with it. Now, focus on that emotion you felt when you heard that noise, the sudden surprise and guilt. In reality, the sound it made was nothing like a hurt dog. It just reminded me of that so much of a wounded pet that I can't differentiate the sounds. Here's the worst part. I shouldn't have felt bad. Those things were stalking and tormenting us. They were likely hunting us and felt bad for harming it. I shouldn't have felt bad about it, but it wanted me to, and so I did. The thing writhed on the ground on its back for a few seconds, making a pitiable noise. It reached back with its arms and pushed itself upright on its hands and on the balls of its feet. Its joints popped wetly and its muscles and bones adjusted to fit this new position. It crab crawled away while shrieking the entire time as Ian pursued it with his walking stick hoping to catch up to it and cave its head in. It wasn't until the thing disappeared from sight that I realized the shrieking wasn't just coming from the monster, but from Jessica as well. It was trying to mimic her response. With Ian gone 
and Yesica's screams possibly drawing more of those things to us, I decided that I had to do something. I stepped forward and wrapped her up in my arms. She was shaking like a leaf in the wind. I stroked her hair and whispered that it was over. She managed to choke out something about its face. All I can make out was that something was terribly wrong with its face. She calmed down as I told her that everything was going to be alright. I didn't believe that myself, but it was the only thing I could think of that might bring her comfort. Ian returned fuming that the monster escaped, and I awkwardly broke off the hug. Ian didn't say anything, he just started walking. We continued following him, hoping that we would find the way, but knowing that he probably wouldn't. Six hours later, we settled down for the night. It felt like we had been going in circles all damn day and made absolutely no progress. For all we knew, the thing could have been tinkering around with our memories and convincing us that familiar landmarks were new and leading us deeper into the wilderness. I didn't tell the others, but I think I knew what those things wanted with us. They wanted to lead us deeper and deeper into the woods. They were trying to force us to exhaustion, and when we were too weak to defend ourselves, they would descend upon us and eat us. Oliver was right about that. If that thing is similar to us in any way, then those twitching spasms were likely some sort of prion disorder that came from eating humans. After eating some jerky, since we decided against having a fire and drawing more of them to us, we reached the conclusion that we would have to sleep in shifts. I volunteered for the first watch because my insight into the monster's behavior had robbed me of any desire to sleep. The others went off without so much as another word. They were exhausted and it wasn't until an hour into my watch that I realized that I was too. Even given the monster's grotesque appearance, everyone needs sleep. Jessica joined me about two hours into my watch. She admitted that she couldn't sleep after our encounter with the creature. I nodded in agreement. Both of us had seen some terrible, terrible things that others hadn't. We talked for a good 30 minutes about what we thought was going on and how everyone was handling it. She was worried about Ian. She confessed that he was acting erratic and that he was scaring her. I wrapped my arm around her for a moment and told her that we were all scared. She looked in my eyes and told me that she was glad I was here, and I felt something twist deep down inside me that I had buried a long time ago when I first met her. The longer she stayed with me on watch, the more personal our conversation became. She confessed that she and Ian had been fighting a lot recently, and that she was wondering if they were going to work it out at all. At the start of their relationship, they were great together. He made her feel wonderful, but there was something that didn't feel right, like there was something missing. I listened to her talk about everything that was going on in her life, and I knew I had to do something. I knew that if I didn't do it now, I would regret it. I had to tell her about the door. She listened quietly as I told her everything. It was the event that precipitated my breakdown at work and my social anxiety disorder diagnosis at the therapist's office. Everything started off simply enough one Friday at work. I was in the lunchroom eating my sandwich and reading a book as per my usual while my coworkers talked about their plans for the weekend. One of them was having a housewarming party 
and they were inviting everybody at work. I figured that the invitation was only extended to the people he was talking to, until he asked me if I would be able to go and make it on Saturday, as it was the first time I had ever been invited to go hang on after work. I chose to go. I spent all of Saturday getting ready, planning what were interesting topics to bring up in case there was a full-on conversation, and the bottle of wine I was planning to give him as a housewarming gift. After psyching myself up, I left to go to the party with the bottle in hand and my spirits high. I convinced myself that I was going to be the life of the party, and that maybe if I played my cards just right, I could finally find a friend at work. That would make the time fly by instead of dragging on. It wasn't until I reached the house that the false bravado began to crumble apart. I stopped in front of the neighbor's house, as everywhere else already had a car parked there. It was then that I felt my heart beating like I had just ran a mile. I began heading up the driveway with the wine bottle slick in my hands from my palms sweating. It wasn't until I reached the front door that I realized that something was terribly wrong. All that excitement that had been building up since Friday afternoon was now replaced with something else. Apprehension. All those topics I had thought up seemed boring, and all the reassurances I'd given myself seemed hollow. I didn't feel prepared for this at all. At this point, a small part of me whispered something that has stuck with me to this very day. That voice intimated that they never really wanted me to come out. They had only given the invitation as a courtesy and didn't actually expect me to come to their house. It said that if I knocked on that door, that I would be making a fool out of myself. It told me that I wasn't even comfortable in my own skin, so how could I even dare to imagine that they would enjoy my company? They wanted to celebrate with their friends. They didn't want to listen to me fumble for something to talk about. All of those fears flashed in front of me, taunting me, demanding that I knock on the door and make myself look like an idiot. That part of me told me that I was better off alone, and I listened. I turned around and without even knocking on the door, I left. No one had come in, and the music was playing loudly, so I doubt that they would have heard me anyway. I shouldn't have been there in the first place. Maybe I saw them watching me from the window. Maybe I didn't. Maybe they were laughing at me as I drove away, flustered and embarrassed. Maybe they went back to the party and joked about the social retard who had seemingly freaked out and ran away from their house while I went home and cried in the shower. Maybe. Jessica listened to her as I told the story. She smiled sadly as I started to cry into her shoulder. All of those feelings I had, I experienced outside of my coworker's house, came rushing back. All of that fear, the foolishness, and fatalistic failure smashed into me like a wave on the shore. She whispered soothing words into my ear and waited for me to collect myself. Once I did, she pulled away and told me that it was not my fault. It was there under the moonlight with her, face inches away from mine, that I did the worst thing I had ever done in my life. I kissed her. It was slow, hesitant, and romantic. I looked into her eyes and I saw her beautiful face. She pulled me towards her as she leaned back. Lost in the moment, I held her against me while telling her all the things I should have said when I first met her and realized that I loved her. 
I held her like that for a few moments, afraid that if I let her go, I would lose this perfect moment. She was warm. She smelt like wildflowers. She smelt like happiness. For the first time in what felt like a lifetime, I felt comfortable. I felt content. I don't know when I drifted off, but I do remember waking up. In the love-drunk excitement of the previous night, I didn't think once about Ian or the consequences of my decision. I only thought about Jessica, and I forgot that she was his girlfriend. What I did last night was a beautiful mistake. I convinced her to cheat on him with me. I needed to tell him before the truth came out. I needed him to understand how I felt. I got up from the ground and stretched. Jessica was gone. I assumed she had gone back to her sleeping roll in the middle of the night. I walked over to Ian, who was just waking up. He was rubbing the sleep out of his eyes and asked me if I had stayed up all night. The words, they bled out of me, and once they started, I couldn't stop. I don't know what happened, man. We were just talking one moment, and then the next. Oh, Jesus, I didn't, I didn't mean for it to happen. You know I love you, man. I, I wouldn't do anything to hurt you. It just happened, and now I can't take it back. Yasika's cry of surprise cut me off before I could go any further. Both me and Ian turned to the sound of her distress, and we knew instantly what had happened. The backpacks with our compass, food, and water had been stolen. It knew. Don't you see it? It knew that we could identify it without a backpack, and it couldn't shape its skin to take the appearance of one, so it stole them away from us. Now, the next time it wormed its way into our group, we wouldn't be any the wiser. Jessica and I never talked that night. Jessica had never left my brother's side that night. They had zipped their sleeping rolls together. She didn't open up to me about her worries, and I never actually kissed her. I poured my heart out to a thing wearing Jessica's skin while it was in my arms. I confessed my truest feelings to an arrest entity masquerading as a person. I felt sick. The others woke up quickly after hearing her screaming. We quickly searched around the area, hoping to find some scrap of food or some indication of where our stuff had been taken to. We found nothing. It was long gone. We had no food no water, and worst of all, no hope. We had no way of telling when one of those things was hijacking our heads and pretending to be a part of our group so it could distract us. With our compass gone, we had no means of following a set direction and hoping to pick the trail back up. In short, we were screwed with a capital S. Oliver demanded to know what I was doing last night. He wanted to know how I could be so careless as to fall asleep when I should have been watching over them and our gear. I lied and told him that someone had come around in the middle of the night to relieve me from my shift. I didn't mention that it was one of those things impersonating Jessica. I couldn't even bear to look either my brother or his girlfriend in the eyes at that moment. Oliver started to yell, but stopped when he saw I was on the verge of tears. I don't know if it was mercy or disgust that caused him to stop. It doesn't matter either way. We gathered up the only thing that they hadn't taken in the night, our sleeping rolls, and we continued walking. The hike without water or the prospect of food was simply unbearable. We were already exhausted, 
and the realization that we were soon going to be starving and dehydrated only served to sap more of our energy. Within a few hours, my mouth felt gummy and dry. While we were still under the canopy of leaves, the temperatures were still high in the 80s and low 90s. It didn't take long for dehydration to set in. I kept licking my lips in an attempt to keep them moist, but I could feel them beginning to crack as my saliva began to dry up. As we walked, Oliver picked up his pace and caught up with me. I looked over at him and knew without him saying anything that another one of those things had joined our group. He whispered to me, Don't look directly at it. Just keep it in the corner of your eyes. I think that's how it messes with your mind. It would explain why you remember that guy that night. But the rest of us can't. You saw him, but the rest of us didn't. Don't get close. Just keep it in the corner of your eyes. It's been trailing us for about a half hour now. I think it just wants to watch and follow us. I pretended to be cracking my neck and looked at the tag along in my peripheral. It trailed behind us by about a dozen feet in its resting state. Its facial features appeared staticky. I can make out eyes and a nose, but it was constantly shifting and rippling like a bubbling plastic piece. At this point, we were too tired to even bother with chasing it off. We just kept walking and hoped that it wouldn't try to join the group. It seemed content to keep its distance and keep us in its line of sight. It followed us for about two miles before it broke off towards the trees with a shambling, awkward gait. We were too tired to even try and set up a shift system. We just huddled together in an attempt to convince ourselves that we were safer when we were closer together. But every time one of us got comfortable enough to drift off, those things would start making noise. The noises started off as high-pitched yips whose sound seemed to travel for miles. As the night drew on, they grew more aggressive. I remember one time as I was drifting off hearing the grating rasp of my name, Evan. The things weren't just following us. No, they were learning. They were perfecting their mimicry. The thought disturbed me more than the idea of them out there watching us in the darkness. How long would it take them to become more human than human? What would they do to us once they were capable of walking amongst people again? I drifted off to sleep with the thought of beating around in my head like a man trapped inside of a wall. We got up on Tuesday morning and left without a word. At this point, there was nothing left to say. Some of us had been awake all night without any food or water. The constant stress had us totally worn down. We continued hiking in the same direction we had been going in with the false hope that we would come across somebody. In the end, our hike looked more like a death march. My feet were covered in blisters that had ruptured and plastered the soles of my feet to my socks. Every step felt like I was tearing open the wounds a bit more. In an attempt to take my mind off the discomfort, I focused on my brother who was walking in front of me. He wasn't as much walking as he was limping forward. He had stopped using his walking stick and was dragging it behind him like it was a broken limb. I watched as he stepped over a rock and the walking stick slipped out of his hands. He kept dragging himself forward as if nothing had happened. He didn't even register it falling out of his hands. It was at that point I knew that something was wrong. I knew that my brother wasn't my brother anymore. 
I quietly picked up his stick as I passed it. Amy went to call out to him and asked if he was all right, but I shushed her. I was so sure that one of those things had replaced him and was now leading us deeper into the woods. I realized that I would only have one chance at this. The instant it knew that we knew, it would try and run away. All it would take was one good swing to the back of its head, and we would be able to take one of those things. The stick had a bit of weight to it, about five or six pounds, enough to crack open a skull if it was swung hard enough. I began walking faster while trying to avoid the underbrush that might give away my approach. The thing wearing my brother's skin continued limping forward as I drew closer. I waited until I was within swinging distance before raising the stick above my head. My heart was beating in my chest, and my palms were so sweaty that it felt like the stick would slide right out of my hands. It kept on moving forwards, completely unaware of what I was about to do to it. I whispered, I'm sorry, just before I swung the walking stick down with all of my strength. Ian turned to face me as he mumbled groggily, Sorry for what? My muscles locked and I stopped mid-swing and the stick stopped just inches away from his face. He blinked in surprise before muttering, Evan, what's wrong? His voice sounded distant and empty, like he was in between a waking and sleep state. It was then that I knew the extent of his condition. He was pale and looked like the slightest breeze would blow him over. He wasn't one of those things. He was delirious from dehydration sleep deprivation, and starvation. The walking stick fell out of my hands and bounced on the ground next to us. I dragged my tongue across my lips, and it felt like I was licking sandpaper. I began to whimper. Jesus, Ian. I thought you were one of those things. I almost, oh God. I'm so sorry. He didn't even react to my apology. He just turned around, continued walking in the direction we were going in. Amy just watched everything unfold numbly before she started following him. Oliver shook his head sadly, but he didn't look any better shape. His eyes were glazed and his lips were cracked and red from rubbing them. I watched my brother shambling forward and it reminded me of one of those old voodoo movies where someone is put into a trance and forced to work until they die from exhaustion. His mouth hung open and he moved like he was being dragged along on puppet strings. I picked up the walking stick and began to follow him. I wondered how much longer he had left in him and what any of us could do if he just fell over and stopped walking. I wondered how much longer any of us had. I don't know how long we walked for. Everything melted together in a muddled mess of time. I remember losing my footing and tripping quite a few times, but I barely felt it. The third time, I didn't even realize I was lying on the ground until Jessica stepped on me as she was passing by. There was no apology. She was too far gone to even recognize what she had even stepped on. I dragged myself to my feet and felt lightheaded, but continued putting one foot in front of the other. The fifth time I fell, I wondered if it would have been better to just lie down and wait to die. An excited yop behind me from one of those things drove me to my feet. It wasn't until we bumped into the sign for Little Bear Canyon that I realized how close we were to salvation. The post for Little Bear Canyon also had a branching sign that pointed in the direction for the TJ Corral, which was only a few miles away from where we started at the Gila Cliff Dwellings, if 
we walked along Route 15. Ian was heading in the right direction, and we were almost home free. In my excitement, I began calling to the others to let them know that the end was near. I looked around me and shouted, Jessica! Ian! Oliver and Heather! Amy! I know where we need to... The words died on my lips as I counted the names and realized it wasn't over yet. The others kept moving as if they hadn't even heard me talking. The imposter shuffled alongside us, and for once, it was easy to identify them. I don't know whether or not they had let down their guard after seeing our conditions, but this one was obvious. She moved slowly, but her movements didn't convey her exhaustion. Everyone else was sweating and looking like the walking dead. But she, she was fine. I waited for her to get close enough to follow the trail the others were going down before I raised Ian's walking stick and growled. Turn around right fucking now. I can see you. She turned around slowly, and I felt my heart skip a beat. She looked almost exactly like Jessica, except for a brown tinge to her hair. She could have been her twin. I knew what it was planning before it even opened its mouth and asked, What are you doing, Evan? Don't c call me that, I winced. What are you rambling about? Please move out of the way. We're almost safe from those things. I know what you are. Heather turned white at the realization. She began speaking quickly. I'm not one of those things. Please, Evan, you have to remember. There were six of us. Those things want us to think there were only five so they can take one of us with the others. Those things don't want us. They only want the weakest one. Please, let's go before they catch. Shut up, I snapped. I raised the walking stick in my hand and brandished it at her. Think about it, Evan. Do I move like one of those things? Do I speak like them? That should be enough to prove I'm human. No. Ian's my brother. Jessica, his girlfriend. I'm your girlfriend. I sat on your lap on the car ride. Please don't kill me, Evan. I love you. Don't you remember? I love you. I lowered the stick that was in my hand as memories bombarded me. I had met her one night when my brother forced me to go to a club with him. Heather had been sitting at the bar all night drinking. It wasn't until she tried to stand up and fell into my arms that we actually talked. I remembered lazy Sundays in bed watching cheesy B sci-fi movies. I remembered holding her close to me after making love and hearing her whisper sweet nothings to me. I remembered our life together. I rasped, Heather. I'm so sorry. I didn't know. She cooed. Evan, it's not your fault. She went to touch me, and I sprang back like I had been bitten by a snake. The instant I heard those words, I knocked. The stick caught her unaware in the side of her face, and I felt her jaw give way to the sudden force of my attack. She burbled through broken teeth. I love. The second strike dented her temple as the temporal bone shattered. She kept trying to talk, but it was too late, and too much damage had been done. That door was shut to me now. I kept swinging the walking stick down on her head until it splintered and snapped. I looked up from her twitching body and saw my brother watching me in horror. Heather! Oh my god! I spoke through gritted teeth and regarded him with red, rimmed eyes. Come on, we have to go. He went to keep talking, but I walked past him. I didn't want to explain it to him. 
he eventually ran ahead. Invigorated with the prospect of finding rescue on the road, I looked behind me one last time. The last thing I saw was one of those things dragging away Heather's corpse. It looked emaciated and half mad with starvation. At that very moment, I wasn't afraid of the thing. I just felt pity. Whether or not it forced that emotion on me, I'll never know. I turned away and caught up with the others on Route 15. We were on the road for 15 minutes before we managed to flag down a car and an ambulance was called for us. The doctor said that our exposure to the elements, combined with our starvation and dehydration triggered the auditory and visual hallucinations we experienced. It's the typical response you'd be given after hearing our half-dead ramblings about creatures warping their flesh and our memories to drive us to the brink of death so they could prey on us when we were at our weakest. We spent a week there while receiving treatments, recounting our horrific experiences, and then subsequent psyche evaluations before we were released. I tried to talk to the others about it. Ian and Jessica refused to talk with me about it. I don't really know Oliver or Amy, so that's off the table too. They just want to forget. I can't forget. Here's the thing. I still remember Nadia asking me to help her find her lighter. I recall staying up late and talking with her by the campfire while she smoked like a chimney. I can recite Gary's terrible puns that he'd make about almost everything, and Lucas's determination at hiking this trail while slowly succumbing to the effects of his multiple sclerosis. I can recall whispering sweet nothings to Jessica under the glow of the full moon. I can still envision that moment clear as day, even months down the road later. I know the conversation we had, verbatim. I can remember the feeling of her skin against mine, and the smell of her hair as I pressed myself against it when I reached that one true moment of connectivity. I remember Heather pleading and begging me not to kill her. Despite writing this all months later, I can see all of those things clearly. Sometimes, late at night, I can even remember driving up to the Gila National Park with Heather sitting in my lap, playfully grinding against me and telling me how fun our hike was going to be. Sometimes, I think about that memory more than I should. Since I can't talk to my brother or Jessica about this, I had to find some other outlet. I guess I'm writing all this for that one reason. Catharsis. In the end, I keep wondering if what I did was right. Did I make the right choice? I want you to read this and tell me that I had no other option. That the risk of one of them escaping into the city forced my hand. I know that's not the case. I could have walked away or tried to scare her off, but I didn't. What kind of person can look into someone's eyes, remember all of the things they did and the life that they had, and do what I did? Who can have all of those memories and end everything so callously? It doesn't matter if none of it was real because in that moment, it was to me. Who can look at someone and feel such love for them before you kill them? The answer to that question is simple now that I ask myself out loud. I just don't like the answer. Hey everyone, What Lurks Beneath here. I hope you enjoyed the conclusion to this video and to the story. If you enjoyed this, go ahead and leave a comment like this video and subscribe if you're new. I'll have tons more exciting content coming in the future with more of cool videos just like these. Have a wonderful night everybody. Take care.